Thank you. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate. Please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Claire Baker to speak to and move the motion up to 12 minutes. Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I am delighted to open this afternoon's debate from the Economy and Fair Work Committee. I think it is our first debate we have had in the Chamber in this new session, uh, focusing on an inquiry into retail and town centres. We all know that Scotland's towns matter to our constituents, but recent decades have witnessed the decline of many of Scotland's town centres. The collapse of many retail chains has left a hole in many high streets. The committees share the frustration of communities that the damage to high streets is done quickly, but any solutions and rescue are slow to achieve. We are still seeing the closure of retail stores. Most recently, the Scottish clothing chain M & Co announced it was closing all its stores, including four to six in Scotland. Other examples, New Look and Marks & Spencers have recently announced rationalisation of their stores, and they are not alone in this approach. Many reasons are well documented. Shopping habits have changed, the cost of doing business has increased, the businesses have perhaps not kept pace with changing needs. But it still leaves the problem of empty units on high streets that is in a high street that is no longer keeping pace with the faster changes in our economy and society. And it still raises the question of to what degree social and economic policy has driven some of these changes to the detriment of town centres. So the retail exodus from our town centres has been caused in part by the ease and lower business costs for out-of-town shopping parks, but also, particularly in recent years, our changing shop ha shopping habits. Changes accelerated during the pandemic as online shopping increased. But at the same time, the pandemic did create a renewed discovery and appreciation of local places, our towns and their potential. And people were looking to shop locally again and to build their communities back. The bleak picture we see does also present opportunities. So the committee sought to focus on the future of our towns and the actions needed to ensure the vision of connected, relevant and vibrant towns is achieved, a vision I'm sure we all share. Scotland's towns are diverse with their own stories. We heard clearly that while central policy is important, the ambition for each town has to be responsive to local priorities. And to facilitate this, there has to not just be capital funding, but resource funding that supports community projects over the longer term to achieve their visions. Throughout the committee inquiry, we heard about the wide range of issues related to towns and what makes them attractive places to live and visit, including transport, amenities, the role and contribution that culture makes, planning and the availability of appropriate and affordable housing to enable town centre living. So two years ago, the report of the Town Centre Action Plan Group, led by Professor Lee Sparks, was published. It made three headline recommendations. Um, include towns and town centres in National Planning Framework 4 and create and implement town plans. Review the current tax, funding and development systems. Expand and align funding for demonstration projects in towns and city centres, sorry, in town centres with multi-year revenue and capital funding. So in April last year, the Scottish Government and COSLA responded jointly, publishing a revised Town Centre Action Plan for Scotland. Shortly after, the Scottish Government published its strategy for the retail sector, and a retail industry leadership group was established with responsibility for finalising a delivery plan. And at the end of last year, the Scottish Government finalised its National Planning Framework 4. The committee welcomes all of these strategies and plans, but wants to ensure that the ambition in these documents is realised and momentum is maintained through tangible actions, and that it, there is a clear coherence between the different strategies. More than ever, the Town Centre Action Plan must be more effective than the 2013 plan in addressing some of the significant challenges. For example, since 2014, there has been a Town Centre First Principle intended to counter the capital flight from many town centres to out-of-town developments on greenfield sites, an exodus, the committee was told, that has led to increased societal disparities. While not a statutory planning duty or requirement, the aim was to ensure that reasons for locating new developments other than town centres were transparent and backed by evidence. NPF 4 stopped short of putting the town centre principle on a statutory footing. However, a report set out the strong e evidence from expert witnesses, including Professor Sparks, that the principle, as embedded, has not achieved its aims. Out-of-town developments continue to be preferred due to the greater availability of cheaper land and lower barriers compared with adapting existing town centre stock. 
So in the absence of having made uh, much difference since its adoption in 2014, the committee concluded this principle had to be strengthened, otherwise the vision for Scotland's Times may not be realised. Committee members had differing views on whether a moratorium on out-of-town developments was the solution, and I recognise the Minister's response to the committee set out challenges making this approach consistent with the planning system. But we all agree that National Planning Framework 4 must be sufficiently robust to ensure that new proposed developments demonstrate town centre sites have been pursued and thoroughly evaluated, that developments will have no adverse impact on town centres and, we will, and will not compete with town centre provision and we will be keeping a close eye on the effectiveness of this approach. Presiding officer, I would like to thank all those who contributed to the inquiry. It is so important for us to hear the voices of businesses, including SMEs and social enterprises. We did not consider town centres and retail solely through an economic lens. Uh, contributions from Culture Counts, from Age Scotland and Site Scotland, among others, were important in considering the purpose and future resilience of town centres. On that point? Um, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to the member giving way on that point and also to congratulate the committee on its work. Um, the member's talking about the fact that our town centres rely both on cultural, economic, housing and a number of significant factors that give each town its own identity and character. Um, are the committee uh, in agreement that actually the balance of success for our high streets and our towns lies in all of these things coming together, one, rather than just one specific area which won't answer the overarching problem? Claire Baker. Uh, Martin Whitfield does raise important points. The committee do recognise that it was, a, it was a collection of efforts that make for successful town centres and they do have to be catered to the individual identity of each town centre. There isn't a one-size-fits-all. We consider the impact of online shopping often seen as part of the problem, but we heard that in some cases it can be part of the solution. The independent retail sector demonstrated agility during the pandemic and pivoted to online, developing into omnichannel businesses, where the online sales supports their high street presence. There is a strong demand among Scotland's smaller retailers for more and better support to build their online presence. The committee wants to see a broader range of opportunities made available to upskill, strengthen and future-proof our retail workforce. We know the Scottish Government has committed funds to help businesses improve their digital skills, uh, capacity and capability and that it is committed to support improved broadband capability and, mobility, and mobile connectivity in towns and town centres to improve local digital platforms. But this, sorry, but this all needs to happen at pace. I'll take a brief interview. The member for taking an intervention. Um, did the committee have um, representation from uh, rural retailers uh, and the, the, sort of the concerns they have around broadband? Clear Baker. Yeah, we did. I'll go on to the visits. We did go to Fraser Brown and Viruri, and this was an issue that was raised um, there. Retail is not served by Scottish Enterprise, although we heard about the support for town centres given by regional enterprise agencies and raised the question over what support other regions can access. Um, arguably, they're all facing the same place-based difficulties. Um, but I digress. The point here is about support for the workforce to help it adjust to what is expected to be continuing and evolving long-term changes to business models and shopping habits. And it's important that there has to be a gendered approach uh, to this transition within the work within the workforce. The committee also called for the development of a strategically driven action plan to support the take-up of training and capacity building to support Scotland's e-commerce activity and in particular the development of omnichannel retail. At committee we heard that Scotland is falling behind hubs such as Manchester and we are falling behind in the skills needed to support this industry. The Scottish Government response states that around £38 million of the £100 million commitment has been spent, but it was not clear to us how it has been spent and by whom, and it would be helpful to have further detail from the Minister on this. The whole issue of skills, the development of Scotland's workforce and future-proofing is becoming something of a thread running through all the different strands of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. We have a serious skills shortage in Scotland. It is hampering our economic recovery and progress and leaving us at a disadvantage compared to competitors. I acknowledge the ongoing independent review of Scotland's skills delivery, but the committee is looking for very specific action around e-commerce skills to be taken now. I do recognise the government can point to a working group or a strategy or a delivering plan to address many of these points, but we've had no shortage of these over recent years, and yet progress has been slow. We need to see a step change and a more radical approach taken if we are to revitalise town centres. 
The vibrant town centres we all want to see again rely much more on retail. During our inquiry, we were welcomed on four visits, first to Dumfries, where members were able to visit, uh, see firsthand what has been achieved there through the mid steeple Quarter development. Um, mid steeple Quarter is a community benefit society in Dumfries that is developing empty high street properties to provide space for local businesses, bringing homes to the high street and giving the community a stake in their future. In Hamilton, we met members of the successful bid um, Hamilton Our Town and heard about the positive steps to bring people back to town centres, including ideas to bridge the gap between their daytime and nighttime economy. And our visit to Fraserburgh and Inverurie, we could contrast whether or not the bid made a difference to developing a well-established, widely shared vision for the future and what effectively supported communities on their journey. In Burnt Island, members met with local business owners and discussed successful diversification into online presence prompted by the pandemic. And while one did access the DigiBoost fund, the other was not aware that it had been available. However, at every visit and throughout our evidence taking for the inquiry, the issue of business rates came up. The committee's report recognised the reforms underway to business rates that are not yet fully implemented, but it was clear from the business community's evidence and the Scottish Government's own Town Centre Action Plan Review Group that our non-domestic rate system is perceived as inequitable and unfair. The current NDR system acts as a disincentive when trying to attract businesses of any type back to the town centres. For businesses already allocated in town centres, the current NDR system acts as a disincentive to invest in already occupied property, as any investment leads to an increase in NDR. The committee constantly heard that the current system works against investment and growth in town centre retail, and that the NDR system should be rebalanced to support town centre development. I recognise this uh, is not popular with all stakeholders, but if we value town centres and want to support a varied retail sector at the heart of them, we need to ensure it is an attractive place to trade. There is a need to address the cost imbalance between out-of-town development and town centre regeneration, and to lower the barriers for town centre development if the vision for regeneration of Scotland's towns, particularly the aspiration to bring back good quality town centre living, is to be realised. I know that other members will probably raise the issue of VAT, but I would like to hear more from the Minister on whether or not there is a recognition there has to be a rebalancing and how he is proposing to achieve that. There is much more that will be covered in this debate, absentee owners and the need for transparency of beneficial ownership, the extent and limitations of our planning powers, the possible introduction of an online sales tax. But the overriding request of the committee is that we value our town centres for what they mean to communities and deliver policy which supports their ambitions. So on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Tom Arthur. Up to 11 minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin for thanking the committee for their production of this very um, helpful and considered report and uh, join members of the committee in thanking those who gave evidence to the committee and helped to facilitate visits. The committee's report highlights many examples of progress, both in our town centres and our approach to retail policy, and in how these interact, and complements our work to deliver both the town centre action plan and the retail strategy. I agree with the committee that a strategic approach to towns and retail focused on sustained long-term actions is required to maximise the contribution they can and must play to achieving the vision set out in our new national strategy for economic transformation. Transforming our towns and the retail economy is a, an exciting opportunity to work collaboratively towards a shared purpose of a sustainable wellbeing economy which supports and connects people and places. On town centres, we work collaboratively with communities, local government, third and private sector to deliver our shared vision and have strong partnerships with local government. These include the newly established Town Centre Action Plan Forum I co-chair with COSLA. A cross-sectoral approach helps coordinate work in my portfolio, across government and beyond. And I am encouraged to see our place-based and community investment programmes making a difference. Disappointingly, this work is now being made more challenging by the UK Government's approach to levelling up, which is not aligned with our policy framework. Notwithstanding this, we can and must celebrate the real and sustained progress we have achieved and continue to double down on this through new policy frameworks, including NPF4, 
the new national strategy for economic transformation, climate action towns and community wealth building. Presiding officer, getting the right change, our retail strategy for Scotland sets out a vision for a strong, prosperous, vibrant and future-proofed retail sector. It makes it clear that retail matters. As a contributor to economic prosperity in Scotland, part of our everyday experience and a foundation stone of our economy. Retail is the largest private sector employer in Scotland, currently employing over 260,000 people in Scotland, an increase of 8.3% on the previous year. Shops and retailers support local communities, attract people into our towns and cities, utilise local supply chains, offer fulfilling, fulfilling employment and support other sectors. Delivery of the retail strategy is now well underway and the newly established Retail Industry Leadership Group, which I co-chair with Andrew Murphy from John Lewis, is in place to ensure we take the right strategic approach. Certainly. Clear Baker. Um, thank you. I did just make a brief reference to the need to take a gendered um, approach to this issue. The committee heard evidence, particularly from Close the Gap, that the jobs within retail that will reduce are the ones that are traditionally female jobs, and the jobs that will increase are traditionally male jobs. Uh, will the leadership group be looking at this issue and recognising where we need to focus our skill development work? Minister. I am happy to um, confirm to uh, Clear Baker that that is the case, both in what we do with regards to looking at our skills, but also within our fair work agreement that we are seeking to develop through the Retail Industry Leadership Group. That is something that is, is very important and is something that is consistent with our broader economic objectives. But, like an officer, our, our policy um, landscape does provide key enablers of work on town centres and retail. I am going to touch upon a few just as now. NPF 4, formally adopted earlier this month, is a fresh start for planning and places our journey to net zero and neighbourhood renewal at its core. For town centres and retail, this means prioritising regeneration of town centres and reuse of vacant and derelict land, while discouraging some types of development, including out-of-town retail. A reform of permitted development rights gives a, a clear signal to be welcoming to investors and to the people who will live, support and enjoy our towns. And it empowers planners to be bold and courageous in pursuing opportunities for thriving communities. Happy to give Daniel way. Johnson. I am very grateful to the Minister for giving way. I was also wondering if you could elaborate on the decision from the Scottish Government not to put the Town Centre First Principle uh, in NPF 4. And I was also wondering if you might uh, 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 speak to the point around change of use. So sometimes it is very easy to change commercial premises into residential, and that can sometimes detract from the critical mass in high streets. Minister. I'm oh, grateful to Mr Johnson for his intervention. As we set out within NPF 4, we have sought to get a policy that is consistent with how the planning system operates. But what I would always urge in reading any planning document, including NPF 4, is to read the document in the round. There are 33 separate policies, and it is, of course, for individual decision makers to, um, in planning matters ultimately to determine whether or not an application for a development accords with the development plan and whether or not material considerations are a factor. With regards to change of use, in our consultation, we did explore the issue of, of um, using PD rights to allow for conversions to residential. However, that was something that we were cautious about pursuing and indeed will not be taking forward, because fundamentally, in my view and view of the government, is that in looking at how we plan for residential uh, property, it is important that that still goes through the planning system to provide safety and assurance. Indeed, there have been examples of other jurisdictions exploring PD rights for, for example, commercial to residential, and they have had outcomes that are not consistent with the aspirations that we would wish to see. I also want to touch presiding office on our community wealth building because through community wealth build, uh, building legislation, our aim is to create a fairer and more prosperous society, enabling more people to benefit directly from the wealth generated by local communities and transform what our economy is for and how it operates. Community wealth building will enable communities to take more control of their local economies and develop these using their assets in line with their needs and interests. It is important to acknowledge that this is a difficult time for many retail businesses. The cost crisis and record high inflation have brought a real pressure on top of the COVID crisis. This squeeze has also been felt in households, so it is understandable why some shops are struggling. 
Larger retailers are more able to respond, and some discount stores are reporting record sales as customers search out savings and supermarkets are price matching their goods. But reducing or matching prices isn't always an option, and I read with concerns, concern of companies of, uh, of concern of companies of established firms such as Paper Chase and M Co, highlighted by Claire Baker, staples of the high street in Scotland, who are closing. And as someone with an M Co in my own constituency, I am aware of the impact that this will have. Whilst it is neither the role of or within the gift of government to shore up these businesses, no matter how painful that might feel to those affected, we do have a role in helping those affected and in helping the retail sector evolve to meet changing consumer demand. Our aspiration for Scotland as set on our economic prospectus with a fiscal policy that supports improved economic competitiveness and resilience underpinned by the principles of fiscal sustainability will enable the creation of an economy that works better for everyone who does business in Scotland, including retailers the length and breadth of the country. Taxation has been touched on, and taxation, of course, affects town centres and retail as it affects us all. I am pleased that the committee recognised the reforms underway on business rates, but acknowledged their continued wider concerns. And I would welcome the committee's and the Parliament's support to address these wider issues, for example, on VAT and the wider issue of potential devolution of VAT. The, landscape, the retail landscape is ever-changing, and competition, I am afraid I have given to already, and I do need to make some progress. I will try and pick up any points in my closing remark. The retail landscape, of course, is ever-changing, and competition from online retail has an impact. Whilst online retail sales have fallen every month since April 2021, from a high of 35 per cent in 2020, they remain 17 per, 17 per cent higher than in 2019. That is 17 per cent more spending online than otherwise would have been spent in shops. A retail business base is made up of 96 per cent micro or small businesses. These small, often independent shops play a vital role in shaping the character and attractiveness of high streets and offer a different customer experience to that of the larger retailers. But they also have fewer resources available and need support to build an online presence. The Government's new national strategy for economic transformation recognises that digital will increasingly impact on the way we live our lives. Digital investment and skills are also vital for a diverse array of town centre uses, as noted in our town centre action plan. We are looking at the best way forward for digital support, building on earlier programmes, and also working with the Business Support Partnership to collaborate to deliver a single joined-up national service for business support. As has been touched on, an independent review of the skills delivery landscape is underway and will recommend an approach to drive forward our ambitions for a skilled workforce as set out in the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. The Retail Industry Leadership Group will consider the recommendations of the review and the opportunities that are forced to the retail sector, and I would, happy to be, uh, would be happy to provide an update to the committee on this in due course. I would like to close with some examples of successes on the ground that support both town centres and retail. And I will just focus on a couple of the examples presented. Officer. I was hugely impressed by the strategic approach to investment in Gala Shields with the Great Tapestry Visitor Centre forming a focal point, and also the Mid Steeple Quarter project in Dumfries, where the Scottish Government's Regeneration Capital Grant Fund is helping to deliver wider plans to repurpose the town centre as a fully refurbished contemporary living, working, socialising, learning and enterprising quarter. Both these projects align strongly with my ambitions to support community wealth building and create places where the community can shape its own future. Interventions and investments to support local businesses and decisions have been taken for the benefit of all. Supporting our towns and the retail sector across Scotland is a key priority for the Scottish Government. I welcome the input of the committee and I look forward to hearing the, members, the, the views of members from across Parliament this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can just advise members that we do have a little time in hand um, should interventions be taken, and I now call on Jamie Halker Johnston. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Economy and Fair Work Committee and as my party's spokesman on business, I'm delighted to speak in this debate on what is an increasingly important subject. And can I add my thanks to that of Claire Baker, to all those who gave evidence to the committee, for those who advised and support our considerations, those who welcomed us into their communities and, of course, to our committee clerks for all their efforts in organising panels, visits and producing our final report. Scotland's high streets are changing in the face of growing challenges. For decades, it was the out-of-centre uh, shopping centres that were the main competition, but in recent years, it's the explosion of online shopping, which can often offer next-day or even same-day deliveries, and often more cheaply than our high streets. 
Our town centres have always evolved with familiar names giving way to new favourites, but recent years have seen the retreat of some traditional stalwarts, such as banks and post offices. And while previously there are always others to replace them, that's often not the case now with an increasing number of premises left empty. To let signs and shuttered buildings are becoming an ever more conspicuous on our high streets as properties remain empty, many of which are simply too big and not easy to repurpose. Even great shopping streets such as Sockey Hall Street in Glasgow aren't safe, with the highest city centre vacancy rate in Scotland at 36%, well above the UK average of 14%. But as the report recognises, the decline in our high streets is not new. It's been happening for decades. But it has gained momentum since the pandemic when businesses were forced to close completely and online shopping became the only option for many families. Public behaviour has changed and how we all shop has changed. But now as our high streets are still in recovery mode, we've been hit by the cost of living crisis, which has seen business costs rise while customers have been left with less money in their pockets. Support for our high streets, both from consumers and from government, has never been more important. But that means a new vision for our high streets, one which recognising changing habits and that the high streets of tomorrow will be very different to those of today. During our inquiry, we heard from a variety of sources on the issues facing our town centres. And while I won't have time to cover them all in depth and detail today, I know some of my colleagues will. We heard of the impact of long vacant properties, buildings which could become increasingly derelict and increasingly dangerous, but which can be difficult to, to establish ownership of. And even when ownership can be established, financial pressures on local authorities often meant that they were reluctant to use the powers they had, particularly if that risked shifting the burden of remedial action unto themselves. And a common theme through evidence sessions was how we provide more good quality mixed tenure accommodation in town centres. In high streets across the country, there were unused properties which could be repurposed. And in our 2012 manifesto, the Scottish Conservatives said that we would encourage the development of more brownfield sites to bring life to cities and towns. And we would support communities' first right to buy when local businesses face closing their doors and relax planning laws to allow for the redevelopment of long-term unoccupied business properties into good quality housing. But it's not just about physical footfall. The committee took evidence during a previous inquiry on the slow uptake by Scottish businesses of an online presence. And this latest report highlights the lack of support available to help businesses diversify online. It also found that there is strong demand among smaller retailers for more and better support to build an online presence. And the committee wanted to know how the Scottish Government will address a situation which sees Scottish businesses much less likely to trade online compared to the rest of the UK. But a reliable online presence requires, presence requires fast, reliable broadband, something too many communities across Scotland, and particularly in my Highlands and Islands region, still lack. And we also heard that for smaller communities, including some in my own region, getting dedicated support to drive forward improvement areas or other local coordination was difficult. Too often it relied on local volunteers who were business owners themselves. The Town Centre Action Plan Review Group identified this, suggesting that a lack of revenue, time and expertise can restrict the potential of community or volunteer-led projects. And that, and I quote, those that succeed are often, often do so despite the situation and system rather than because of it. Presiding officer, I know my colleague Douglas Lumsden will talk in more detail on business rates and other tax issues, but this isn't a clear area where the Scottish Government could and should be doing more. Because the business community's evidence, and from the Scottish Government's own Town Centre Action Plan Review Group, was, as the Claire, uh, Claire Baker highlighted, that the non-domestic rate system is perceived as inequitable and unfair. The report highlighted the disadvantages in which Scottish businesses ra business rate policy places the retail sector as well as how the current non-domestic rate system acts as a disincentive in both attractive, biz, attracting businesses back into the town centres, as well as in encouraging those already in town centres to invest in their property, as it will, could lead to an increase in their NDR. And the Scottish Government has further disadvantaged Scottish businesses by refusing to grant the same 75% business rates relief in Scotland that is available to businesses in England. This despite Barnet consequentials from the UK Government, which has funded this. It is a conscious decision taken by Scottish ministers which has left Scottish businesses paying more than they would in England. 
But rather than working to reduce logistical and cost burdens on our high street businesses, the Scottish Government is actually increasing them. Short-term let's licensing, the tourism tax, the workplace parking levy, and of course their latest and potentially most damaging plan, the almost universally derided deposit return scheme. Despite concerns from the retail sector, in fact from virtually every sector, the go this Government is pushing ahead. But even the SNP leadership hopefuls have now raised issues with the scheme, either calling for a suspension or for the scheme to be dropped. Humza Youssef wants a year's grace period for small firms. Kate Forbes, the Minister's boss, has said the scheme will cause economic carnage if it goes ahead as planned. Carnage. And Ash Regan, somebody I'm not normally prone to agreeing with in here, has said that businesses in Scotland, I quote this, are businesses in Scotland already struggling right now, and this is absolutely not the right time to be piling more things onto them, something that could cause some of them to go out of business. And she's right. And she's also right when she said business reaction to the scheme should have been ringing alarm bells in government before now. So why wasn't it? It's an utter shambles. Presiding officer, there are many other very important areas I could have covered today, how the cultural sector can play an increasingly increasing role in supporting our high streets, how good access to our sound cent town centres is vital, and that both better public transport but also support for those with mobility issues is key. But our report was clear. Our town centres have their own unique identities. There is no one blueprint that would work in every high street across Scotland. It is, as the report says, about empowering communities by supporting and encouraging local decision making, allowing local people and local businesses, those who know their areas best, who have the passion for their communities, to drive forward successful projects. But what is clear is that government should be supporting businesses, not putting extra burdens upon them. Ministers should be removing barriers to regeneration and investment, not introducing new ones. If we want our high streets to survive and to thrive in the future, as I don't doubt every member in this chamber here today wants, it will need more than warm words. It will need real and sustained action. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Colin Smith. And thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased the Economy and Fair Work Committee agreed to carry out our inquiry into the future of our town centres. You won't be surprised to know I'm especially pleased the committee agreed to visit my hometown of Dumfries as part of that inquiry. It's where I was born, it's where I've always lived and it's where I bring up my family and it's heartbreaking to see the decline in the town centre over the years. The town centre really matters to me and it matters to all my fellow Dunhamers, just as it was clear throughout our inquiry that town centres really matter to residents and communities right across Scotland, because their value is more than the sum of their parts. They are convenient places to access services, shops, jobs, entertainment, places to live, but they are more than that. They are part of the, the very fabric of our communities, our history, our culture, our very sense of place. They are about who we are as a community, and I believe that means the focus, the investment, the protection they receive should go beyond a strict economic value that is placed on them. No one is ever going to look back at a historic photo of an out-of-town development in 50 years. No one will ever reminisce about which supermarket was in that development before the current one. But we do look back on the shops, the theatres, the cinemas, the homes that once brought us together but are often now lost to our high streets. And if we do not take urgent action soon, then there will be even less to bring us together, never mind look back on. That does not mean our town centres do not need to change. They already are. But we need to do far more to support them in that change, in particular retail and especially those independent. I will take an intervention from Stuart. Stuart McMillan. I thank Colin Smith for taking intervention. Would Colin Smith agree that it's sadly that some of the decisions uh, of the past, uh, and I mean distant past, have actually led to, uh, in part, to some of the situation we currently face in terms of our town centres? Colin Smith. I agree entirely with what Stuart McMillan says, and I will come to that very point at the moment, as Professor Lee Sparks made, made the, the, I think, the very good observation that we need to stop damaging our town centres in the way that we have certainly done so in the past. And that does mean, I think, more support for those independent shops in our town centres who have a real stake in our high street. And the retail is going to be crucial. It has changed, it has reduced in our town centres, but the Scottish Retail Consortium reminded us that retail still employs 233,000 people in Scotland and contributes £5.8 billion to the economy, highlighting just how integral retail is to, and I quote their words, the fabric of our communities 
and our society. The pandemic has accelerated changes in retail, in particular the shift to online shopping. However, Professor Lee Sparks, whose evidence to the committee, and I think whose work in this area has been invaluable, was correct when he said the pandemic has accelerated and exasperated some trends, but those trends themselves are long-standing. And the point that Stuart McMillan made, Professor Sparks went on to say, they will not be reversed without concerted efforts over a number of years, and that effort needs to start with us all agreeing to stop doing harm to our town centres. President Officer, if we want to better protect our town centres, the time for tinkering at the edges is over. That is why I supported calls that were made to an inquiry for a moratorium on outer town developments where there is space and opportunity to develop in a nearby town centre setting. We simply should not be allowing out-of-town warehouses that offer the same products that can be, or in some cases already are, available on nearby high streets. If that isn't going to mean a moratorium, at the very least we need to see a meaningful town centre first approach. That didn't happen when the government adopted the principle of town centre first without any real statutory meaning in 2014. And sadly, MPF4 <laughs> fails to properly underpin a genuine town centre first approach. And, President Officer, we won't get the change we need if we don't address the current fiscal imbalance between our high streets and the advantages that exist for out-of-town developments and online shopping. More than any other issue, the cost of doing business in our town centres was raised with the committee during our inquiry. It's not a new issue. The government established Town Centre Action Review Group's report in 2020 stating, and I quote, the non-domestic rate system is widely perceived to be operationally broken and unfair. Yet not enough has been done to level the playing field between a high street shop and a supermarket and an out-of-town development and between bricks and mortar businesses and those who trade exclusively online. During the inquiry, some members of the committee visited Burnt Island where they met local businesses to discuss the role of e-commerce as part of a high street shop. Yet just a few miles away, in Dunfermline, is a massive Amazon warehouse covering more than 950,000 square feet, the size of 14 football pitches. It's not classed as retail, so that means it pays millions of pounds less in tax than it would if it was shops on our high street. Why should small and medium-sized businesses pay exorbitant business rates while giant online corporations like Amazon get away with paying far less per square metre? President officer, we need to end this injustice with an Amazon tax on big, exclusively online traders and use the income to cut the bills for bricks and mortar shops on our high streets and in our town centres. This town centre first approach should also extend beyond retail to housing, where support for new housing should be more generous, where it utilises space in our town centres, recognising the extra cost of developing on brownfield sites and when renovating existing buildings. That also means tougher powers to tackle absent landlords who leave buildings in a state of disrepair, and it means action from the UK Government to end the ridiculous anomaly of charging a higher VAT rate on the redevelopment of existing housing stock than to new build. The Government can also support a genuine town centre first approach when it comes to how it allocates funding for infrastructure projects such as new theatres, new leisure facilities. Where local authorities and others bring forward plans, it should be made clear by government that applications for funding projects that play a genuine part in regenerating our town centres will get government support. Unless we give people more reasons to come into our town centres, to shop, to live for leisure, then they will continue to decline. President officer, I mentioned the committee's visit to Dumfries earlier. Every town is unique with its own unique challenges and therefore its own unique solutions. But in many ways, Dumfries is a microcosm of town centres across Scotland. Hit by the impact of out-of-town developments, online shopping, easy access to cities, the consequence has been more and more empty shops. But the visit itself did give members a real glimmer of hope in the way the community is fighting back. Just as our visit to Hamilton gave us the opportunity to meet members of Hamilton, our town, at the local business improvement district, and hear about their excellent community-led work supporting town centre businesses, the visit members made to Dumfries gave them the opportunity to meet with the Mid Steeple Quarter. That is a community benefit company taking the problem of absent landlords, tackling the problem of absent landlords directly by becoming the landlord themselves, taking back our high street shop 
buy shop, invest in, in neglected properties to deliver the uses that the town itself has identified as it needs. Affordable retail space, community space and, crucially, new housing in our high street. But their journey was hampered, made slower because of the lack of revenue support for this work as they became established. That is why the committee urged the government to consider the need for seed funding for community-led projects that really are listening to the community and driving forward regeneration. President officer, I want to add my thanks to everyone who gave evidence to the committee and maybe more importantly for the work they do every day to support the town centres that they care passionately about. But they do need more support from government. The government's response to the committee's report was largely a case of business as usual, a list of work already happening. Now, I recognise there are many welcome initiatives that have been developed in recent years. But if the committee were happy with existing work, we wouldn't have carried out our inquiry in the first place. We, want, we need to see more action on the cost of doing business on our high street and delivering a level playing field with exclusively online businesses, on saying no to damaging out-of-town developments and having a more strategic approach to investment in housing, leisure, retail that does genuinely put our town centres first. As I said at the beginning, the time for tinkering is now over. Thank you, Mr Smith. We now move to the open debate. I call first Fiona Hislop to be followed by Ros McCall. Around six minutes, Ms Hislop. Uh, President officer, as a graduate in economic history, I was always struck by the analysis that England was described by historians as a country of large towns and many villages, whereas Scotland was characterised by many smaller towns and villages. Small town Scotland has in the past had negative connotations, but I think this millennium, with the COVID pandemic making us consciously and physically rethink our geographic boundaries and loyalties that our towns can and should be reinvented for modern work, play, rest, shop and living. My Linlithgow constituency has six towns and a number of villages, uh, each quite distinct and different, and therein lies the solution, as Professor Lee Sparks clearly set out in his evidence to our committee. From the old ancient royal borough and market town of Linlithgow, with an innovative one Linlithgow community development trust and bid combined, who gave evidence to the committee, to the long archetypal main streets of former mining towns of Armadale, Whitburn, Broxburn, Up Hall, to the brand new burgeoning new town developing in Winchborough from a former shale mining village, and to Bathgate, whose community council has been retelling the story of the town through plaques. Bathgate is, of course, home to Scotland's first ever business improvement district and its Choose Bathgate initiative has helped build resilience to town centre shop occupation and complementary digital sales, bucking trends elsewhere, resisting the pool of neighbouring larger Livingston. So we, we are clear that town centres are not just high streets and although we did look at retail, it became very clear that returning high streets to living accommodation to replace lost footfall from hybrid workers was a big agenda, but with cost prohibitions which must be surmounted. So much is happening in this area. <coughs> As the Minister's reply and speech set out, there's a plethora of funding, policy and initiatives. The Scottish Government's Town Centre Vision, the new Future for Town Centres report, the response, the new Retail Industry Leadership Group, bids, MPF4, permitted development rights and new class uses, town centre uh, regeneration funding, derelict and land and vacant land funding, place-based funding, community empowerment funding, uh, uh, the, the place principle and the town centre first principle. So we were told by Phil Prentice of Scotland's Towns Partnership that there has never been so much resource and attention being invested in town centre work. So we must capitalise on that and drive town centre work forward with energy and conviction. The character of each town, their needs, their story, their community can lead to the best town action plans. But this does need support to cultivate and nurture. And the lack of community development personnel and funding, as, as Colin Smith has just said, can hold things back. The community empowerment funding element to this is important. And although capital funding is welcome, it often lacks supporting revenue. So we heard we offer private sector often more leeway in risk than community-led initiatives. And we question that. 
The much recognised Dumfries Quarter Steeple project um, led uh, re re regeneration originated in a community arts project by the Stove Cultural Organisation, and our report stresses that role. The uh, fabric of many of our high streets has been improved by heritage funding capital grants from Historic Environment Scotland and culture projects funded by Creative Scotland has breathed new life into these towns, the many, for example, cinemas that have been refurbished via cultural uh, funding, I think has brought, breathed life into many town centres. But many towns are blighted by vacant properties and derelict, derelict land, like the Victoria uh, Hall space in Linlithgow and the old bus depot office at the Cross in Linlithgow. And our councils need more powers to take these spaces over. And we must also pursue the recommendation of transparency of ownership and registering responsibility. Now, the Minister notes in his reply that the UK Government has launched a similar scheme which requires that any overseas entity buying or selling land and property across the UK will need to be registered. But, Minister, will this be available to local authorities, enforcement departments, and will it address the barriers which limit Council's ability to use their existing enforcement powers? I was shocked that apart from one flat which had someone living there, almost all the properties in the main street of Dumfries when we visited had their second floors lying empty when conversion to flats would bring regular football and vibrancy. Now, MPF4 and local flexibility on new classes for use can help attract new businesses, but we will need to provide incentives for town centre living works. I am also very disappointed in the Minister's response that the very successful Digital Boost Grant funding is not being implemented in favour of digital productivity labs. Now, if we know that Digital Boost uh, has driven economic growth and activity and therefore public revenue return, then surely there is a case for having both. We need to incentivise businesses to locate in town centres, and that either means making it cheaper for them to do so or more expensive to locate outside. Now, we were provocative in our recommendations, but we are yet to see if NPF without statutory prohibition has done enough or if it will fall shy of preventing out of town development. Now, I know the Minister will pay attention to all these points. He was very impressive in committee, and I know he's committed to this and is a very able minister, but I hope he acknowledges the concerns and criticisms raised. raised by the committee. And we must face the future for town centres with realism, but I also think optimism. With an ageing population, we need accessible town centres with local hubs and bespoke, and, and, uh, uh, bespoke bus services. A hub and spoke uh, mechanism can help do that. 20-minute neighbourhoods demand that. We also need to think about people with disabilities and design those neighbourhoods accordingly. Presiding officer, our towns connect us to each other. We realised this more than ever in 2020 when that connection was lost with lockdown. We must champion our towns, we must keep them open for business and living, and we must ensure that they, fr they thrive and are fit for future decades. Thank you very much, Ms. Hislop. I now call Ros McCall to be followed by Gordon MacDonald for around six minutes. Ms. McCall. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I join colleagues in thanking the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for their excellent and informative report. As someone who left school and started working for House of Fraser stores quite some time ago, um, I worked in that chaotic, wonderful world of buying trends, sales periods, merchandising, displays, promotional push and understanding pay packet time management. I'll give you a classic example of that. How many people do you know who get frustrated about Christmas displays in shops in October? Yep. <laughs> Customers have two months' salary to spend before the big day, and therefore retailers need to start advertising displays to capitalise on it. Start too early in September and you confuse the Halloween period, wait too long and you miss the split between buying gifts and the Christmas Day shop. But no one wants to focus on Christmas Day before the schools have taken their midterm holidays. But retail need to have you thinking about Christmas before the end of October pay. Traditional retail doesn't work in the here and now. Summer clothes lines are ordered in winter and displayed in stores a good two months before you think you need them. Plans for that year's Christmas display are worked on as soon as shoppers go out to the January sales. You have to understand the issues facing the retail sector, the time factors in business planning and where support is needed before you can help them. Our high streets are in steady decline and help is required now. Deputy Presiding Officer, town centres are dissolving before our very eyes and unfortunately the SEP plans to make radical improvements are lacking and have been found wanting. 
I have raised this question in the Chamber many times since becoming an MSP. The last time was only a few weeks ago. In an attempt to find out just how the multitude of plans will make a difference in reality and just what we will expect to see happening from them that would save our town centres. The committee was absolutely right to raise this point in their recommendations where they called for policy cohesion due to the myriad of strategies and they've been eloquently listed by Fiona Hislop. The last answer I received in this chamber was to wait and give it time. Time was the panacea, time would cure all, time was needed for the various plans to come into effect. Unfortunately, it's times that our high streets are rapidly running out of, which is worrying. As was referred to in the conclusions and recommendations of the committee's report, as retail is extremely important to Scotland's economy. The sector is experiencing a significant period of change. However, it's not all bad news for the retail sector. In particular, the independent retail sector is thriving in certain places. And I'm going to draw an example of Cooper in the region I represent. The mix of retail, business, residential and community is so natural there that people there have felt welcome and encouraged to stay local, shop local and spend local. As a result, the number of empty businesses units in the thriving Fife town has more than halved since 2019. Now, this is fantastic news, and it should be a basis for other towns across Scotland. However, when you read the overarching themes of the Scottish Government's retail policy, sector, people, place, just transition, you can see that the policy intention is designed to deliver the aforementioned magical blend. But as with so many policies put forward by this SNP Government, they're not listening to what the sector is asking for. The Scottish Retail Consortium regularly publishes reports highlighting the concerns for Scottish retail. And the following points are all in their own words because I couldn't put it better myself. They tell us Scottish store vacancy rate was 15.7% in the most recent quarter, which was quarter four of 2022. Most importantly, that has remained at the same level for three quarters now. With regard to Scottish retail sales, they say that commuter demand, commu consumer excuse me, demands remain fragile and the outlook is uncertain. They're asking for consistency towards policy making, town plans and the Scottish retail strategy, saying Scotland town centres have a great deal to offer. However, the loss of commuters and business travel over the last three years has been sorely felt. Retailers are playing their part in trying to tempt shoppers back to our towns and city centres through a blend of price, promotions and service. And the state also needs a concerted effort to reduce the cost of operating in our town and city centres. With the 2021 review of the town centre's action plan... I will, yes. Stuart McMillan. I thank Ross McCall for taking the intervention just on the point regarding price. Uh, now, I fully accept... Uh, that the, particularly when it comes to fuel when, when some supermarkets in particular have got petrol stations, uh, that uh, there is a price differential from location to location. However, uh, when you've actually got uh, petrol stations, uh, I can think of Tesco and Morrison's and Morgan constituency in particular, that are charging up to 10 pence per litre more as compared to places in Linwood and Renfrew, then that's going to be a hindrance to actually increasing the footfall into those particular supermarkets, but also the wider town centres. Rose McCall, I, I can give you I, time back. I thank the member for the question. I actually am quickly looking back at my speech because I didn't mention fuel. But anyway, um, I, I, I thank the question, and it is a valid point, but it's not actually the point I'm trying to make. This is promotions, price and service. It states needs to be a concerted effort to reduce the cost of operating in our towns and city centres. With the 2020 run review of the Town Centre Action Plan saying explicitly that town centres have become too expensive to operate in and this restricts economic activity. They go on to say, whilst they applaud the Scottish Government's decision to freeze the business rates for 23-24, however, the freeze shouldn't be the limit of Parliament's ambition on rates. Presiding officer, if we truly want the offer on our high streets to work. We have to take on board what is being said by the people on the front lines. We can provide the rates relief for all those sectors if the will is there. 220 million was provided by the UK government for the rates relief scheme. Not only would we have been able to put that in at a cost of 200, uh, 204 million, but the scheme was also paid for, the implementation, excuse, the implementation costs were also paid for. 
When towns like Cooper are bucking the trend, there is hope. The answers are there, if only we would listen. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms McCall. I now call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Carol Mochin. Around six minutes, Mr MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I remind members that I am the chair of the cross-party group on independent convenience stores? The committee report has a focus on town centres, as well over half the population of Scotland live in our towns. Town centres should be the beating heart of our communities, the length and breadth of Scotland. However, our high streets have been changing in recent decades. Many chain stores have been closing from Burton's to Woolworth's, leaving large vacant buildings which are difficult to let and soon become a blight on our town centres. This trend was accelerated by the pandemic as more people shopped online. In December 2019, online share of retail sales was 19 per cent just before the pandemic hit and rapidly rose to 38 per cent in January 2021 as shops closed during lockdowns and people avoided unnecessary social interaction. In order to turn this around and put our town centres back at the heart of our communities, we need to tackle the large number of empty commercial properties by bringing them back into use, although not necessarily as retail units. The footprint of our main shopping areas, areas has shrunk, and those buildings on the periphery could be converted into much-needed homes where this is possible. This could also be the case with the empty storeys above shop units, bringing people back to live at the centre of town. We need to increase footfall, and we heard from witnesses who provided examples where large empty retail units have been converted into gyms, health centres, council offices and college space all of which has helped bring people back into the centre of their town, supporting retailers and hospitality businesses. We also need to encourage the growth of independent retailers, support the creation of incubator units for start-up businesses and encourage social enterprises if we want to see thriving town centres again. In order for this to happen, landlords have to realise that long leases of 10 or 20 years are no longer acceptable to everyone as in the current economic climate, nobody wants to take on that risk. In the West Side Plaza in the Western Hills area of my constituency, the landlord has let one empty unit to the community wellbeing space, home to the community wellbeing collective. This is a group of 30 people who live in and are connected to Western Hills, who aim to enhance health, wellbeing, develop local action and create community cohesion in order that they can tackle the effects of poverty, social isolation, and low mental health. One way of assisting all new tenants and landlords of empty commercial properties would be for the UK Government to amend the VAT legislation. Depending on the nature of building work, the purpose and the VAT status of the client, then VAT can be charged at either 20 per cent, 5 per cent or even zero rated. This confusion can create a disincentive for anyone to invest in old buildings that are often lying empty or abandoned, which could be brought back into use. In recent years, prior to the pandemic, across both cities and towns, the proportion of independent retailers was increasing, while the proportion of chain stores was decreasing. Post-pandemic, this trend is continuing. However, independents now have to compete with online retailers, who in many cases have lower overheads. In order to protect our town centres, we need to encourage brick and bricks and mortar retailers to trade online in order that they can add additional sales from out with their area, enabling them to support their businesses to remain on the high street. Currently, 35 per cent of Scottish businesses have an online presence. However, only 20 per cent of businesses believe that they have the skills they need to trade on the internet. The Scottish Government's Digital Boost Development Grant was significantly oversubscribed, highlighting the support businesses need in developing their digital skills. The pilot digital pro productivity labs sorry, need to be rolled out across Scotland as soon as possible to provide tailored support programmes for the retail sector. Evidence from Business Gateway indicates that Scottish businesses are still reluctant and not necessarily picking up the opportunities, so their digital maturity is not yet as evolved or developed as we might want it to be. 
Other witnesses highlighted that although Scotland has 8 per cent of the UK population, we have less than 2 per cent of the e-commerce jobs located north of the border. Small businesses need that support now. Presiding officer, there is no doubt that retailing has faced many challenges in recent years, from the financial crash of 2008, Brexit and then the pandemic. Brexit has resulted in staff shortages, lack of goods from the EU, or obtained at a higher price, but it's not all bad news. The good news for our town centres is that this Christmas, shoppers return to the high street as there were no restrictions in opening hours as in previous years. Online sales fell by 30% from its peak to a 27% market share, partially due to postal strikes, making deliveries uncertain. For the five weeks to 31st of December 2022, total retail sales in Scotland increased by 11.3% <coughs> when compared with December 2021. Even adjusting for inflation, these figures still remain a positive, sitting at 3.9%. We need to take this opportunity and support our town centres to once again be at the heart of our communities. Thank you very much, Mr MacDonald. I now call Carol Mochin to be followed by Michelle Thompson around six minutes. Ms Mochin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank members of the committee on all of those who contributed for what is an important and indeed timely report. Our town centres, as we have heard, should be the beating heart of our communities, but for too long, as the report notes, they have been in decline. In decline due to, yes, a lack of investment, but also a change in habits, with people becoming more inclined to go to shopping centres and retail parks and do shopping from the comfort of their home online. It is not realistic to suggest that these are trends that we would be able to reverse entirely. Indeed, it is not realistic to believe that change is not required as people will return to the town centres in time. What we need is town centres that are, that are adaptable, vibrant, diverse and modern. Town centres that meet the needs of individuals and a family in 2023 and town centres that are consistently underpinned by community and togetherness and supported by a determination here, as the report mentions, to rebalance the cost of doing business in town centres compared to out of town. Presiding officer, I cannot contribute to this debate today, however, without mentioning a vital relationship highlighted in the report, which is the importance of local government in improving our town centres. Across Scotland, we have a vision for what our town centres ought to look like, what they could look like to meet the needs of a modern Scottish population. However, for those dreams and visions to become a reality, they need funding. Local government, local councils need funding. It is therefore, in my view, beyond belief that year after year, budget after budget, that the SNP cut the budgets of those who provide our local services the services that so many rely on. I have no doubt, and we have heard uh, the Minister, of course. Emma Harper. Thank you, Carol Mochan, for giving way. In my work, I've been doing some stuff around derelict buildings, so I'm here listening to the debate today because that's important to me. But does Carol Mochan agree that the local authorities do have several discretionary statutory powers available to tackle derelict buildings, which the report actually outlines amenity notices, defective building notices and dangerous buildings notices. So there are powers that the local authorities have. Carol Mochan, I can give you the time back. Thank you. I acknowledge the point um, that uh, the member is making. I think the point that I'm trying to make is it's about the wider role of local government in supporting their communities and that there is absolutely an acceptance that the current administration do not value the role of local government as much as perhaps we would all like. Um, in my view, we, you know, we must do better on this front. Um, and at this point, I wish to pay tribute to East Ayrshire Labour councillors who were able to secure key concessions in this year's budget for the people of East Ayrshire. 
They secured increased investment in tackling antisocial behaviour to make our town centres safer. They ensured resources would be given to tidying our streets and removing vandalism to make our town centres cleaner. And they worked to keep key amenities such as public toilets open to make our town centres more accessible. And the, the Labour councillors put forward these uh, key points and key amendments because they are areas that are listed by our communities and our constituents of things that they would wish to see done better um, and would help improve our local communities and town centres. I pay tribute to them because it is Labour and local government that are trying to find ways to deliver for the communities despite the challenges that are laid before them in terms of local government funding. It is important also, like my colleague Colin Smith, that I speak a bit of uh, town centre housing. Um, moving forward, we have to make town centre living an attractive prospect. Um, I look to Labour-run North Lanarkshire, where previously used buildings such as churches are now being renovated by councils and housing associations to create state-of-the-art modern and accessible homes, so using those powers that they can to the best of their ability. Crucially, they are being built in close proximity to retail, health services and transport hubs, providing an affordable rate as council housing, but maintaining some key components of the pre previous use to ensure familiarity remains for local people. Presiding officer, in order for our vision for town centres to be met, we have to be proudly speaking not only about council house living, but town centre council house living, supplemented by key amenities and resources that will bring life back to towns across our country. Absolutely, we can have a use our centred approach, but we must also look to do all we can to ensure that this approach, approach acts to the benefit of the small businesses that we've heard about, the low paid workers and the local community. The observations made in the report in this regard are of significant concern, particularly in that many local businesses just do not know where to look for support. We must focus our efforts towards absolutely ensuring that there is a diverse range of options available to town centre users, but also reaffirming the view that these small businesses moving forward see the benefits. In concluding, presiding officer, I once again note the importance of this report and thank the committee for bringing it forward. We have a lot long way to go to realise the vision of our town plans, but to ensure we get there, we must ensure that people, residents and small businesses are at the centre and all are supported by strong funding for local councils to deliver on these key areas of work. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms Nochin. I now call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Maggie Chapman for around six minutes. Ms Thompson. Firstly, uh, can I thank the clerks, the convener and the vice con I'll start it again. Can I thank the clerks, the convener and the vice convener for guiding this long and complex inquiry? I'm pleased to speak to it as part of the Economy and Fair Work Committee, but I'm also, of course, influenced by my other work, such as on the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Now, presiding officer, you'll be pleased to know I propose to outline just a few personal thoughts as to why town centres and their regeneration uh, are important and I guarantee I will take less than the prescribed six minutes. As an important yet often forgotten part of Scotland's economy, they have a vital role to play not only in terms of local communities but in terms of sustainable economic growth. And sometimes we forget that amongst these other elements there are powerful hubs of business activity and not least of all SME activity, which is such a critical role to play in our national economy. And so if town centres contract, it's not only a tragedy for many communities, it almost certainly has a negative impact on sustainable growth, as well as a multitude of impacts in other areas, such as culture, a sense of place, and so on. And the range of affected areas have already been noted by Claire Baker as our convener. Yes, indeed. Daniel Johnson. I wonder if the member might agree with me that sometimes when we discuss uh, town centres, how empty retail units might be used, we almost treat in equivalence their purposes between commercial purposes, residential and indeed sort of voluntary, but actually that commercial hub that town centres represent is actually critically important. We need to have that focus on that commercial use. 
Michelle I, Thompson. I, I strongly agree with the suggestion he makes, and perhaps that's where the allowing for the flexibility, as outlined in the planning system by my colleague Fiona Hislop, gets increasingly important because they must be hubs, community hubs, which allow for a variety of activities. And actually, I go on to say the type of act economic activity in town centres is much more broadly based, even just now, than many realise at present. So I can go to town centres in my own constituency, and of course there's retail shops there, but there's professional services, accountants, pubs, entertainment venues, community playgroups, cultural centres, coffee shops, and many other types of SMEs. Sometimes, however, the challenge is that these different activities interact with different support funding opportunities, different regulatory controls, and so on, meaning that a town centre can be a place amidst a complex web of policy and funding support streams, and I think that's part of the challenge to help move things on. This complexity has got an added dimension in that it's not the same everywhere. And the committee's rightly pointed out that the different remits and sometimes the very, very different delivery focus of the three enterprise agencies that together span Scotland. It worries me, I must say, that there is a gap in place-based support available for towns and communities not cover covered by either Highlands and Islands Enterprise or South of Scotland Enterprise. And I know the Scottish Government has been asked by the committee to respond for this, and, and I, one, hope that the, the Government will be able to increase their thinking around this arena. It can't be justifiable to effectively have some towns and communities having less ease of access to support funds than others. Another issue that's been known about for some years is the need to address the cost imbalance between out-of-town development and town centre regeneration, and I know it's already been brought up today in this debate. And so we have to find creative ways to lower the barriers for town centre development. And in my judgment, we will simply not be able to realise our aspirations to regenerate Scotland's towns if we don't tackle this issue head-on and give it due importance in policy development. Now, the, the committee's further commented on, and indeed today in the debate, current VAT rules add to the imbalance, and they add to both distortions in local communities and create further disincentives. We've heard examples of that earlier. So the Scottish Government is asked to set out what discussions it's had to date with the UK Government on VAT, but in truth I'd go further. If it is possible to devise tax incentives, incentives to support free ports, which are much more controversial business places, then perhaps we can think more creatively about releasing some of the tax burdens on town centres. And I'd venture to point out if, say, a reduction in overall tax burden had the result of encouraging many more small start-up businesses in our town centres, the cost to the exchequer would be minimal or even better. Now, although I focus mainly on economic and business issues, I end by joining my colleagues in recognising the quality of life benefits to be had from thriving town centres and the important history they are of us and from us and we will continue to be within them. They can bring real social and environmental improvements to town centre communities and that has to be nurtured and treasured. After all, is it not the purpose of politicians to provide such improvements for the people we serve? And we, I'm sure we all aim to do that. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms uh, Thompson. I can advise the Chamber we've got a bit of time in hand, so members shouldn't feel constrained in their uh, comments. But thank you very much indeed, Ms Thompson. Uh, I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Siobhan Brown. A generous six minutes, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking all of those organisations, community groups, individuals and businesses who gave up their time to share their experiences and expertise with the Economy and Fair Work Committee during this inquiry. I also want to put on record, like others have done, my thanks to the committee clerks and SPICE researchers for all their support during the inquiry and the production of the committee report. And of course, thanks to my committee colleagues for their thoughtful work on this important topic. We have already heard, and will likely hear more, consensus expressed this afternoon, mirroring the consensus that has been widely shared within the evidence and conversations of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. To a large extent, we share a clear vision of what we want for Scotland's towns and their centres, as unique and cherished places where humans and non-human nature can flourish and thrive. Town centres where people of all ages both those born nearby and those who have come from further or far away share a vibrant and supportive community of care 
support and discovery. Where they live in comfortable, warm, safe and dry homes, appropriately and sustainably built, converted or modernised. Where they can reach the places where they need to go by active travel or public transport, easily, accessibly and affordably. Town centres with local businesses where people can easily buy or access the goods and services they need for their day-to-day -day lives. And also many of those special purchases and projects that, at their best, can be a pleasure to choose as well as to enjoy or give away. Where customers know that what they buy in their own town is of good quality, responsibly sourced, and that they are not being forced to pay significantly higher prices than elsewhere. And where they also know that they are contributing towards good and fair livelihoods, sustainable businesses, places where employees, partners and co-owners can work free of insecurity and precarity, with decent pay and fair work for people of all genders and ages. Businesses that are good enough in every sense to attract customers from far as well as near. Town centres with all the important places that people need to gather together. Schools and nurseries, libraries and community centres, surgeries and advice centres, venues, cafes and pubs, and all of the special places they can enjoy either together or alone. Gardens and parks, beaches and riverside walks, green spaces that heal and restore both mind and body. And town centres that recognise and celebrate their own stories, the histories, cultures and memories that make them unique, knowing that those histories are far from over. We also share many common perceptions and insights about the barriers to achieving that vision. We recognise resource limitations, especially financial, and the difficulties which can arise from imbalances between capital and resource funding. We acknowledge with deep regret policies and practices of exclusion. These, too often, have served to reward the already privileged and push the marginalised yet further outside circles of care and consideration. We see, in particular, that patterns of out-of-town development have often assumed that residents have access to private cars, leading to ways of life that are both environmentally unsustainable and socially unjust. We have noted failures of participation and of opportunity, and have heard disappointing experiences of discouragement and cynicism. But we have also heard and shared many encouraging and positive ideas about how to overcome those barriers and achieve the futures that our towns need and deserve. We have heard something about best practice in Scotland, including from towns in my own northeast region and from across the world. We know that Scotland's towns need genuine and robust support, frameworks within which carrying out those best practices is not only possible, but attractive, exciting and easier to achieve than the bad alternatives. These frameworks of support have to work for all of our towns, acknowledging underlying patterns of exclusion and marginalisation. They have to recognise not only underinvestment, but forms of investment that have been unhelpful or limited in their benefits. They have to name and redress the long legacies of industrial change without transformation the broken promises that have left communities isolated and abandoned. We know from examples like Inverurie and Huntley that Scottish towns, not least, I might even say especially towns in the North East, can be imaginative, sustainable, original and groundbreaking in their shared vision for the future and their shared participation in making that future happen. And we also know that other northeastern towns, their residents no less imaginative, generous, community-focused or forward-looking, towns like Peterhead and Fraserburgh, have been left behind by decades of austerity and neglect. It is our role urgently now to take up that shamefully abandoned responsibility and to make the just transition not only a reality but a priority. Finally, we need to look with clarity and honesty at the scale of the task ahead the task of helping Scotland's towns to become truly resilient, places of community, culture and mutual support in the climate change to years ahead. We need to be bolder in challenging vested interests, in dislodging the inertia of the status quo, in enabling genuine participation in decision-making, in amplifying unheard voices and in prioritising well-being and real sustainability. Both present and future generations deserve no less. And I look forward to working with colleagues across this chamber on this task, 
to make our vision for our towns to be uh, for our towns and their centres to be unique and cherished places where humans and non-human nature can flourish and thrive. Making that vision a reality is our task. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Chapman. I now call Siobhan Brown to be followed by Graeme Simpson again around six minutes. Ms Brown. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the work of the Economy and Fair Work Committee on their inquiry into retail and town centres in Scotland and the subsequent published report, and I welcome the opportunity to contribute in this debate today. If I may also declare an interest as the Chair of the Town and Town Centres CPG, and I'm hosting a reception this evening celebrating an evening of improvement districts in Scotland, and if any of my colleagues would like to attend, you'll be more than welcome. Let's rewind back 25 years ago. When I first moved back to Scotland, I initially stayed with my grandparents who lived in an ex-mining village three mi miles out of Ayr. And every couple of days, my grand would get on the bus to go into Ayr to get her messages. And in those days, Ayr was absolutely buzzing. The length and the breadth of the high street was jam-packed with retail choice, Blockbuster, John Menzies, CNA, remember all of them? Everybody looks back on those days with treasured memories and nostalgia, and there is a demand to get the towns back to the way they were. But the hard, cold truth is our towns will never be the same as they once were. And over the past 25 years, we've seen a steady decline in our town centres, not only in air, but across the whole of Scotland, as they face challenges of changing and evolving retail patterns. We've seen retail industrial estates open out, up, out with town centres. The main supermarkets have based themselves on the outskirts of towns. And of course, the increase in online shopping. All this has been exacerbated and accelerated further in the past few years by COVID-19, Brexit, and now the current cost crisis. And for many, it's still a hard fact to accept our town centres will never be the way that they were many years ago. But I do believe there is a common understanding that our town centres are vital to the collective well-being of our communities, economy and environment. And now we have the opportunity to completely rethink how we do things and move forward with ambition and optimism to rebuild our town centres to be vibrant, creative, enterprising and accessible. And I welcome the Scottish Government's approach to delivering its town centre vision that is centred on collaboration and partnerships working to build on local assets. And as we know, local authorities have the responsibility for delivering local economic development and local regeneration. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government's Town Centre Action Plan can only succeed if it is supported by effective partnership working. And I would just like to focus initially on this point, because I think it's a really ex extremely important point. Town centres are not going to be transformed overnight, and there needs to be an ambitious vision and long-term plan in place, which all parties must be involved in, regardless if you're in administration or opposition, to drive progress forward. I was elected as a councillor in 2017, and a lot of energy, time, investment was dedicated in planning to transform Airtown Centre. And the Airtown Centre Regeneration Group was set up with councillors of all parties invited to contribute to the long-term plan of air. Sadly, opposition councillors did not attend any meetings to contribute, but instead just were very local in the local press, opposing any plans the administration put forward. The council decided to purchase an empty department store to transform it into a much needed local leisure centre. And once the council committed to this investment, we saw the private sector have confidence to invest in air, and a private company bought a neighbouring empty super, uh, shopping centre to turn into a new cinema complex to coincide with the opening of the leisure centre. Now, this would have been transformational for Airtown Centre and convert a huge chunk of empty retail into leisure. And unfortunately, as too often is the case, opposition parties opposed any plans of this development. And now in administration at South Asia Council, they've cancelled the Leisure Centre project. Hence, private investment has now pulled out. And at this present time, there's no long-term plan to transform Airtown Centre. And another consultation has been launched, although this work was already done back in 2018. If we're ever going to see progress for the sake of our town centres, we need a cross-party, cross-administration approach. We need to put, go beyond the politics for the sake of politics and put our constituents and support for town centre regeneration at the forefront. 
On a more positive note, whilst some of our towns are struggling, we also have some examples of towns that are flourishing. And what a better example to look at than the town of Preswick, which I'm really proud to represent in Parliament. After all the extraordinary hard work and commitment by the community, Preswick was crowned the best high street in Scotland in 2019. And if you take a visit to Preswick, which I invite you all to do, you'll find that there's plenty to keep you occupied. It's got more restaurants and cafes than you can count, and is full of small independent shops, and has a nightlife that attracts many from afar. Despite the challenges of the past few years, business is still booming in Preswick, and there's stiff competition to take up any vacant retail spaces that emerge. The reason Preswick has succeeded where others have failed is because it has taken an individualised approach that serves the need of the community. And I strongly believe that Scotland should be an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial superpower where people with bright ideas and ambitions are encouraged to open up business and contribute to the economy, just like so many people in my constituency do. We must support... I've got, got 15 seconds, sorry. I can I give you the time back, must, Ms Brown. So, OK, clear back here. Sorry. Clear back. Um, thank you. I'm interested in the example she's given because we did visit different towns and sometimes we found that while the ones that were successful we could point to you know they had good local businesses and but there were also factors like it was a cheaper place to do business the parking was easier the community was a bit more mixed there was a bit more money in the community so that's the examples that we saw i wonder if Preswick has any of those advantages that maybe neighboring areas need a bit more support in order to achieve the success that they've had yes Thank you, um, and thank, thank you for the intervention. I think Air, Air Town Centre is quite unique because I think 30, 40 years ago, you did have the residents and all the flats above the shops, which in time has moved away. And in Presswick, what is different, and it's also in Troon as well, is that you've got a lot of residents and um, residential dwellings in the town centre. So I think that makes it busier as well, which is the difference between Air specifically as the county town and Presswick and Troon. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, looking back to the past is important. It allows us to learn lessons from mistakes made and, of course, indulge in nostalgia. But if we're to succeed, we must look ahead with a fresh perspective, new ideas and endless ambition. And that is how our town centres will thrive again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. I now call Graham Simpson to be followed by Evelyn Tweed for around six minutes. Please, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I think it's been a, a, a really uh, interesting debate so far, and I've enjoyed listening to the contributions, um, particularly uh, the last one from Siobhan Brown. I'm uh, always interested in hearing from Siobhan Brown. And she mentioned uh, a couple of towns uh, in her patch, uh, Eyre uh, and Presswick. Uh, and I had the pleasure of uh, being in both towns uh, very recently, and I drove. Um, I was on a visit uh, to Air uh, and then Presswick, uh, and uh, actually drove through Presswick Town Centre. It's the first time I'd been in Presswick Town Centre. I was on my way to to the airport, which I've been to a few times, but never through the town centre. Uh, and I remember uh, commenting uh, to a colleague. I thought that was. Uh, that's lovely, that place. That's, that's so varied, and I'll have to come back here. And that's what it's like, and I think the picture that Siobhan Brown uh, paints was exactly right, so I fully intend to go back there and uh, park up and uh, do some shopping, because uh, that's, that's the way I like to see a town centre. Um, I think the point, that, uh, the point here is that town centres come in all shapes and sizes, and if I may... Um, I'm just going to mention uh, a few in my own region, of course, representing a region. I've got lots of towns. But if I can start uh, in the town that I live in, East Kilbride, um, and we've got uh, Scotland's, well, it's billed as Scotland's largest undercover uh, shopping mall. Um, and it's been, it's been struggling for uh, a number of years, and it recently went into administration. It's still in administration. Um, you know, so, so a huge shopping centre in administration. Um, I spoke to the administrators yesterday, um, and I think, I, think the, I think the message is it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there is a, a plan being worked on for East Kilbride where we could look at uh, reconfiguring. Maybe we can have a bit more of a leisure mix uh, as opposed to 
mostly retail. Maybe we can get more housing. Uh, but the centre's not been put up for sale yet, and I don't think there's any particular rush there. If we then turn to um, Hamilton, where, which the committee visited, and it's a different, it's a different picture. There is a covered mall, um, but as a most of the town centre is, is, is not covered, um, it is uh, out, out of doors, a little bit like Presswick, and uh, you've got uh, a relatively successful bid project there, which the committee came across. I should say I wasn't on the committee at that point. Um, I, can't, I joined uh, at, the, at the tail end of this inquiry. So a different picture there. And then go across to uh, North Lanarkshire, and you have uh, Cumbernauld, another new town, um, unfortunately twice uh, the winner of the Pluke on the Plinth uh, Award, uh, uh, which, were, which they won on the now defunct, thankfully, Carbuncle Awards, uh, but not, 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 uh, not some... Yes, I will. In, in defence of Cumbernauld, the reason that that award is defunct is because it caused great offence to people who lived there. And actually, it's a good thing it's defunct, and we should be celebrating um, all the, the fantastic things that towns do. And he said he would be optimistic. So why is he dwelling one on the past and also on a negative past? Graham Simpson. Well, I am being optimistic because there is a plan for Cumbernauld. Um, it has attracted £9.2 million uh, of levelling up uh, money. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, sorry that uh, Tom Arthur was uh, so negative about the levelling up funds, but that money is going to help uh, regenerate Common Old Town Centre. And I, like Fiona Hislop, uh, I'm delighted that those awards don't exist anymore because they were entirely negative. Uh, and uh, she's absolutely right that people, people didn't like having this badge applied to their town. But I think uh, there is hope for Cumbernauld, um, thanks to actually all stakeholders working together. Governments, both governments, a council, and unlike Carol Mocken, I couldn't care less what the political persuasion of the council is. Um, I don't think anyone does, because there are councils of all shapes and sizes and colours in Scotland who are doing their best for their town centres. Um, so for her to stand up and say only Labour can deliver good town centres is frankly ludicrous. Um, but there is hope for Cumbernauld. And then if we look at uh, Motherwell, um, where there is uh, work going on, um, and I see Claire, Claire Adamson at the back, there is uh, work going on uh, in Motherwell to improve the town centre. There's work going on uh, at the station. I think we'll end up with a, uh, a nicer offering in that town. So we come in all shapes and sizes. And so I just wanted to make that point. Uh, the, I, I think um, if we want to attract people into our town centres, um, we need to be looking at things like, and others have mentioned it, getting people living there. We need to look at things like free parking. Um, if you want to attract people into town centres, we need to um, offer, th offer things like that. Um, we need to look at the, the, the rate system. And um, uh, if I can just uh, end, uh, the point that uh, Age Scotland make uh, about people having access to town centres, and I think this is where public transport comes in. So we really need to look at having uh, a, a really good public transport offering uh, in all our town centres, because too often it's too difficult to get in and out of them and if you want customers and we want footfall, um, we need a decent public transport system. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Simpson. I, I now call Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Alec Rowley for around six minutes, Ms Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would like to thank colleagues today for a very positive debate on our town centres and how to get them thriving again. And like Siobhan Brown, I too hark back to the days of a thriving air town centre coming from air originally. And when I was small, every Saturday, I went to town with my mum and we had a good look round the shops. Sometimes it was a bit boring for me if my mother was on the clothes shopping mode. However, I really enjoyed going to Woolies uh, for a look at the toys and maybe pick and mix for the bus home. 
I doubt if that's an experience many children and adults have these days. Throughout most of the last century, we had a planning system and governments that supported real retail in the town centre and clearance of housing. Prime sites on principal shopping street streets soared to extraordinary values. And then American-style malls came in and were reliant on massive anchor stores, which are now failing due to the rise of online retailers and support for out-of-town shopping centres. And we've spoken a lot today about that already. These retail parks, however, did perform much better than the high street during lockdown and the pandemic. We are never going to recreate the town centres of my childhood, but we can create vibrant town centres that can be central to the ambition for a 20-minute neighbourhood across Scotland. The committee's report asks how the government might incentivise social landlords to build in town centres. And from my professional experience, affordable housing should be central to the regeneration of town centres. And I am pleased to see that the Scottish Government is already investing £3.2 billion in affordable housing over the five years of this Parliament. This... Yes, I will. Clear I... Adamson. Can I thank uh, Evelyn Tweed for taking that intervention? My um, colleague mentioned Motherwell Town Centre um, earlier. Um, I also have Wisha Town Centre in my constituency and uh, tomorrow I'll be cutting the ribbon on trust housing's development in the town centre. It has been a gap site for almost 25 years, right in the middle of our town centre and it's going to bring new homes right to um, adjacent to the local businesses and, and, and reinvigorate the whole town centre. Would you welcome that um, development in my area? If we're in two, then I can give you the time, time back. Okay, thank you, President Officer. Yes, I think that's absolutely amazing, and I'm going to go on to speak more about that in my own constituency and in other places. So, this is an increase of more than £541 million on the previous five year allocation, which is an uplift of more than 20%. Now, social landlords will need additional funding for brownfield sites for poor site conditions or contamination, and they will need to be encouraged that projects that seek to regenerate town centres will be prioritised by the government. Providing housing in town centres has multiple benefits, providing much-needed housing, the residents do not need to have a private car, derelict buildings can be repurposed or demolished and crucially bringing people into town supports businesses and encourages other businesses to move in. And it was good to hear Colin Smith's comments on Dumfries and that Dumfries was included in the case studies as part of the report from the inquiry into town centres and retail. I worked as a development director for a social landlord in Dumfries for 15 years and I took the view that the use of the affordable housing grant would be better spent in town centres. I am probably responsible for at least 60 of the new houses that was noted in the report and also brought student accommodation into the town to serve the expanding Crichton campus. From this experience, however, I can say that Brownfield Town Centre sites are not easy to develop. It carries much greater risk than greenfield locations, and no matter how much feasibility work that you do, things go wrong. There are unforeseen costs. The social landlord is then left responsible for those additional costs. If the government really wants to incentivise landlords, it needs to provide a safety net if things go wrong and provide support and potentially further funding, even when the development may already be on site. We also need to be prepared to address planning issues. Moat Bray, now the National Centre for Children's Literature, is also mentioned in that report. 
The social landlord I worked for at the time purchased Smokebury as it was derelict and it was an eyesore, and was keen to build 20 desperately needed flats. Now, the intention at the time was to maintain the facade and provide flats behind with a visitor centre commemorating J.M. Barry, who had links to Motebury. However, a community trust opposed the development and eventually the association transferred the property to that group. The Motebury restoration by the Community Trust took 10 years to build at a cost of £8.5 million, made up of public donations and various grants from the Heritage Lottery Fund, Creative Scotland, etc. The Housing Association's plans would have probably cost about a million and a half pounds uh, of public money and taken about a year to complete. Now, the point of this story is that putting housing into historic town centre buildings, particularly where demolition is involved, is not always popular. But Ms Tweed, could we start the winding up of your remarks, please? OK, thank you. Um, I'll just skip to the end then. So... If I'd had a bit more time, I actually thought I had more time than that, but if I'd had a bit more time, putting social housing on greenfield sites when town centres are struggling makes little sense. Let's ensure there is a real focus in the allocation of housing budget to regenerate our town centres and support social landlords to achieve this. Thank you, Ms Tweed. I now call Alec Riley to be followed by Co-Cap Stuart. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Thank Riley. you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this committee debate today on the conclusions and recommendations within the inquiry into retail and town centres in Scotland report. Scotland's town centres have been under ongoing pressure in recent decades with the rise of out-of-town shopping, online shopping and then the pandemic having a major impact. My first point would be there needs to be some kind of levelling up between out-of-town versus town centre. A point picked up by the committee in recommendation 25, where they say the committee agrees that the overarching principle must be rebalancing the cost of doing business in town centres versus out-of-town sites. The same can be said for shoppers who face parking charges and access issues when choosing to shop in town centres versus free parking and convenience on the out-of-town parks. Many businesses in town centres like Dunfermline and Kirkcaldy raise the issue of parking charges and point out it is just cheaper and easier to go out of town, and therefore surely that needs to be addressed. And then there are the higher costs to businesses based in town centres Recommendation 30 of this report says more needs to be done to address business rates in town centres, and Claire Baker has touched on that. In Recommendation 31, the committee state the current non-domestic rate system acts as a, distinct, a distinctive uh, barrier when trying to attract businesses back to town centres. So there are clear messages in that report, and I do fear we've got yet another report and then another report and what actions are going to be taken. So I think there are some really good points the committee are making that need to be picked up on. The committee adds that consistently they heard that the current system of, of uh, non-domestic rates works against investment and growth in town centre retail and that non-domestic rate systems should be rebalanced to support town centre developments. Our business rate system must support growth and innovation, encourage good business and no longer penalise our high streets and governments must take this on board. I also note that the committee picks up on the fact that not all town centres have business improvement districts. Indeed, in Dunfermline, it was businesses themselves who voted to reject continuing with their bid company, which is proven now to be a big loss to the city of Dunfermline. So I do support the committee when they say at recommendation 36 
the Scottish Government is asked to set out how support will be provided to towns and communities where there is no bid and without any local community resource. Indeed, I would make the case that where town centre funds are established, the out-of-town stores should be required to contribute. As I know from the Dunfermline experience, this was an issue for many of the smaller businesses who did contribute and then voted not to continue with the bid. They felt that there was an imbalance between what they were being asked to pay and contribute compared to all these out-of-town centres, some of them just, just 100 to 200 yards from the town centre. Um, I would also say there needs to be a better structure and process for coordinating partnership working at town centre level. Local authorities, in my view, have a critical role to play, but the decision making needs to come at a local level. All town centres should have development plans that are designed locally, costed and driven by all partners. The committee make the point. Yeah. Baker. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank Alec Riley for taking part in the debate. He's not a committee member and he's obviously read the, the report thoroughly. Um, does he support the committee's suggestion that it would be helpful to have a central resource that communities could pull on, whether that was for legal advice or you know, other kind of support and advice if they were looking for community options, but something that was delivered locally, uh, sorry, centrally that they could pull down on? Alec Riley. Yeah, absolutely. I think, the, I think government needs to look at how their role is in terms of support. And I would say, as a former leader of Fife Council, uh, I sometimes worry that the council have far too much to uh, we'll tell you what you need, rather than how can we support you. And I think there needs to be a rebalancing around the role of the councils. They need to support, they need to put resources in, but they need to not be dictating uh, what, what the decisions will be at the end of the day. The committee make the point that culture and heritage has an important role in town centre regeneration and sustainability. I agree, but I would suggest there must be a fairer distribution of such funds from national organisations beyond the large cities into smaller cities and large towns across Mid-Scotland and Fife, and indeed across Scotland. There certainly is a view amongst many organisations that if you're not in one of the large cities, a lot of these national organisations simply ignore uh, the pleas and that the pot's not getting split up as equally as it should. I welcome the committee's highlight at recommendation 14 the value of an increased demand for online and e-commerce activity. One example of good practice is Cooper in my region of Fife. Just last week it was reported that Cooper has cut the number of empty business units by more than half, a success hailed as groundbreaking and possibly the best in the UK. Vacancy rates dropped from 18.2% in 2019 to just 7.6% last year. Colleagues may have seen the um, Cooper featured in the BBC's My Kinna Town programme, and this is because it is home to Scotland's only digital improvement district, Cooper Now, whose various platforms show the town's active community and vibrant businesses. This kind of success story is welcome and should be looked at in more detail by government to find out if more forward-thinking approaches such as this can be developed to allow local-level tailored approaches to local economic development. Presiding officer, my experience of town centres is that there are a lot of businesses, social enterprises, culture and art venues, all committed to working for the improvement, but often feel frustrated at the lack of support and often stumbling blocks being put Mr. in the way Riley, could you by bring your public close. authorities. So in conclusion and finishing up, my message would be we must empower local stakeholders and communities and build for the future by building in partnership. Thank you, Mr Riley. And I now call on COCAB Stuart, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Stuart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the Economy Fair Work Committee for their very detailed report. Uh, we're all too well aware that Scotland's town centres have faced increasingly challenging circumstances year on year, with a seemingly relentless onslaught of obstacles undermining the success of high street retail businesses, large and small. 
changing work patterns and shopping habits, not necessarily created by the pandemic, but certainly accelerated by it. Recruitment issues exacerbated by the ongoing fallout from Brexit, economic challenges uh, posed by increased energy costs, transport costs and other inflationary pressures. All of these things are combining to make life for retailers an ongoing uphill struggle. I would like to take the opportunity to commend in particular small and medium-sized business owners the length and breadth of Scotland, including in uh, Glasgow Kelvin constituency, for their commitment to customers and their perseverance in the face of challenging conditions that they find themselves operating in, delivering high-quality goods and services, as well as their proven adaptability and resilience does them huge credit. I welcome this report and the Scottish Government's commitment to address the challenges faced by retail in our towns and communities. I would like to highlight the Retail Strategy Delivery Plan being prepared under the leadership of the Minister for Public Finance, Planning and Community Wealth. I hope the plan will be prepared and enacted with a sense of urgency. Key aspects which will significantly determine the scale of the plan's success are identified in the committee's report and include a requirement for cross-portfolio policy cohesion, ensuring that resources and initiatives dovetail to maximise their positive impact. Upskilling and future-proofing of our retail workforce, particularly in the areas of creating and growing an online presence, is another important strand of the plan of the support needed from government to enable all retail businesses to benefit from the increasingly important multi-channel model of selling. The Scottish Government has committed £100 million to businesses to improve their digital skills, capacity and capability. It has also committed to support improved broadband capacity, mobile connectivity in towns and town centres to improve local digital platforms. Like the committee, I would welcome more detail on how this vital funding will be allocated and to whom. I also note the committee's request that the Scottish Government consider what equalities expertise the group uh, taking forward the retail strategy delivery plan demonstrates. It's very important that this group be equipped to deliver effective strategies to remove barriers to advancement for women in retail, which has very traditionally had gendered role structures, but also for people of colour and those with disabilities. It is worth considering how Glasgow is responding to the challenges facing retail in its city centre. And some of my colleagues have mentioned uh, some of the streets within my constituency um, uh, that I am very, very familiar with. And how Glasgow is seeking to support the businesses to adapt and be successful in these most difficult of times. Like all retail centres, the economic impact of the pandemic on Glasgow City Centre was profound and is ongoing, with its low residential population and reliance on regional travel-to-work population, Glasgow City Centre and the West End of the city have traditionally boasted a high number of retail businesses reliant on those specific drivers of footfall. I would like to commend the work of Glasgow City Centre Task Force for the work that it is doing to tackle the economic challenges facing the city. Since 2020, it has supported retail and attempted to maximise footfall return into the city centre with marketing campaigns, event funding, maximising the use of outdoor spaces, tackling antisocial behaviour and targeting cleansing and environmental interventions. The task force brings together all the core city sectors, including retail, hospitality, the nighttime economy, higher education and transport, and it is an excellent example of cross-portfolio working. 
I also was able to yesterday um, attend a, a, a meeting uh, by the Glasgow City Multi-Agency Group, which brings together a wide range of stakeholders, including, for example, retailers, Police Scotland, street pastors, and the Motivation, Commitment and Resilient Pathways Group, that work collaboratively to share strategies in a practical solution-focused way to ensure safe and inclusive inclusive retail experience. In, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Committee has done a thorough job of investigating the issues facing retail businesses, uh, our town centres and communities, and they have also presented some very clear practical options to support retail to survive and thrive in an increasingly fast-changing environment. I welcome the report and I look forward to hearing what I hope will be a very positive response to it from the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Stewart. We now move to closing speeches and I call on Daniel Johnson to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I should obviously begin with the declaration of interest, which, given that I come from the retail industry, is substantial. I am uh, currently a, a director and, and sole shareholder of a business with retail interest. So suffice it to say, I'm, I'm extremely biased towards the retail industry and make no apology for it. Uh, but look, actually, I, I think there's been a really good debate. I think looking at both town centres themselves, but actually the health of the retail industry more generally. And it is incredibly important. But I think one thing I was struck by, uh, you know, listening to both Siobhan Brown and, and even Tweed in particular, is that people do, I think, have a lot of uh, nostalgic memories. But actually, retail has always gone through change. Over 100 years ago, people railed against the rise of the department stores uh, and the loss of individual uh, mercantile trade. And then people railed after the Second World War about uh, uh, you know, people putting stock out that you didn't have to ask a shop assistant to see it. And then people in the, through the 1780s railed against the rise of the big national retail chains. And in fact, I remember the tail end of that through the 90s, living in a retail family. So in a sense, the current change is part of a, a longer-term progression. But Colin Smith is, I'll just go in a moment. Colin Smith is absolutely right. That is what's at stake here is much more than just places of business. Our town centres uh, go to the very heart of the identities of our places, which is why this is important and why we need to uh, think about this very carefully. And I'm happy to give way to Fiona Hislop. Fiona Hislop. The committee was very struck, end of Reese, that, that, that those empty spaces above shops in the past would have been used for stock and storage, but also in looking at the economics of retail, which she's very, very familiar with, that kind of just, um, you know, just in case uh, storage has now been replaced by just in time. So therefore, that kind of turnaround of, uh, of stock has completely changed. So we've got all these vacant places above shops, even if they're still there. Daniel Johnson. And indeed, I think this is a really important issue about how we use our town centres. Uh, and I shall just come on to this, but I'd just like to briefly touch. I think the committee's done a really excellent job, and, and, and Claire Baker did an excellent job of setting out, I think, the, the, the constituent elements that a town centre needs to thrive. Because it's not just about the shop units themselves, it's about the transport links, it's about housing density, and it's about use. But it's also why I was very keen to support Michelle Thompson and what she was saying. And it, and, it, and it touches on, I think, one of the points that's important here about the use is that these are commercial centres. You know, Tom Arthur is absolutely right. Retail is a massive employer. So actually making sure that you maintain the critical mass for that commercial activity is important because of the jobs it supports. So this is why I think we need to take great care about change of use. So I absolutely, I think we need to bring space above stores into uh, residential use. But what I would take care, and which I was trying to uh, allude to in my intervention with the Minister, is what we need to actually do is make sure we preserve retail space. Uh, I think converting that too easily into residential space can undermine footfall. Because what I would observe as a former retailer is that workplaces just simply generate 
far more fruitful for retail premises than uh, residential dwellings. Now, if you can have both, that's great, but, but I don't think you should view them as kind of absolutely equal and commensurate. So I think the one thing I would say, I'll just come to Grimson's in a moment, is that it, we need to ensure that we retain uh, retail units and hopefully in so doing, drive down rent to lower the barrier of entry for people entering retail in our town centres. And I think if we can come up with policies that do that, we'd be on to a winner. Happy to give way to Graham Simpson. Simpson. I thank Daniel Johnson for taking the intervention. I just wonder um, if he agrees with me that actually it's about getting the, the, the balance right. So it's not just about having lots of retail. Um, we do need people living in our town centres, and too many have too few people living there. Um, and it's also about um, you know, having uh, restaurants, places to eat out, theatres, if there's space available. Daniel Johnson. I think he's absolutely right. It's about that balance between a working population, a residential population, a visiting population, but it's also a balance between those uses. People aren't always going to be buying goods. They may be buying services. And I think if there's one little thing I would just again caution people about is actually this isn't necessarily just about retail, but it is about consumer-facing businesses in our town centres because actually sometimes services are just as useful and just as good at creating vibrancy in our town centres. So I think, I think that balance is absolutely right and it's finding that equilibrium and thinking about how planning policy, tax policy, about how the policies of local councils uh, uh, play into that is really important. And I think I'd really like to highlight the, the, the points being made uh, by Siobhan Brown, Carol Mock and, and indeed Alex Riley, is that local authorities have an absolutely pivotal way, and I think totally agree with Alex Riley, is that we need our, our, our local authorities to work in partnership with our, our town centres and, and, and uh, to help them thrive. Now, there was a good deal of discussion about online, and I think that is critical. We need to do everything we can to support uh, businesses move online, because frankly, no retail business can survive if it's purely physical. That's just a fact. If you're not trading online, you are, you are trading to, in, into decline. It's as simple as that. But what I would observe is that those skills aren't just purely digital. I would say that the hardest things about getting your retail business online is probably photography, writing copy. The digital bit is actually quite easy. And what we need to do is make sure that obtaining those skills is easy. And I would just gently point out to the Scottish Government, you know, scrapping part-time courses at colleges and things like photography has perhaps uh, hindered that. But, but most importantly, in terms of that transition, we need those rounded skills, which aren't necessarily technology skills, and make sure that they're accessible to people who are very busy running businesses. Now, just finally, I think we have to talk about non-domestic rates, because if you talk to retailers, that will be their first uh, point. And I, I would say to the Scottish Government, I don't think non-domestic rates, if you're looking at it as a new levy, would pass your principles for taxation. In terms of proportionality, in terms of efficiency, in terms of certainty, this is not a tax that is any of those things. It has unintended consequences which haven't been accounted for. It is at, one of the reasons the government likes it, it always brings in the same amount of money. But that's because it's not reflecting actually the health on state of retail. So I think we have to rebalance so retail isn't paying twice as much as its overall contribution to the economy. I think we need to repurpose elements, which is why I think we should be looking at actually uh, treating places like Amazon as retail premises, not warehouse premises. Make sure that you know, if they were paying their fair contribution of non-domestic rates, it wouldn't be £3 million of non-domestic rates they'd be paying, it would be £60 million. And finally, I think we probably need to replace it, because until you do, with a better uh, levy that actually reflects business health and encourages investment rather than hinders it, we're going to continue to have a problem. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I, I would remind members that uh, those who have uh, spoken in a debate are expected to be here for the start of closing statements. I note one member was late back and one member still hasn't come back. And, of course, that is a discourtesy not just to the Chair, but to all other members who participated in the debate. And perhaps we will hear from these members in due course. Mr Lumsden, uh, thank please you, wind Presiden up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to eight minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the retail sector and town centres, the length and breadth of Scotland, are facing enormous and often unnecessary pressures at present. And I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate. And I would like to also thank all the organisations who have sent in briefings ahead of today's uh, debate. Uh, this government and those before it, led by the SNP, have presided over a period of decline in Scotland's retail sector. And the change in shopping behaviours was predicted and accelerated by the pandemic. 
But this should not mean that we accept defeat and manage the decline. We should have had plans in place a decade ago to change how we use our town centres, with more people living and working in our centres. But time and time again, we see no plan from this government to re-energise, to reinvigorate our town centres. No plan to boost economic growth in the hearts of our communities. No plan to bring jobs and opportunity to these areas. And no plan to help small businesses flourish. President officer, the SNP and Greens have never been a friend of Scotland's small businesses. What we have seen is an anti-business government, one that seeks to restrain businesses with unwanted, unnecessary bureaucratic shackles. I will give way. Um, the, the Economy Committee has heard repeatedly about the importance of the small business bonus, which this government brought in, which wasn't there before, and is saving thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of businesses from paying any business rates whatsoever. That is very pro-business. Douglas Lumsden. Well, it's, it's, just, it's just unfortunate it was cut at the budget we just uh, didn't long uh, have. But what we are also seeing is bureaucratic shackles. Um, there is nothing more evident anywhere else than the, sh the shambolic disaster that is the deposit return scheme. Businesses of all sizes across Scotland have been calling for the scheme to be reconsidered for months. Yet this government seems determined to plough on. Granted, it has been uh, suggested that small businesses may be given some sort of exemption. But the when, what or how still remains, muddying the waters and creating more uncertainty for businesses. Proven once again of this government's disdain for small business is their decision to vote through reforms to the small business bonus scheme in the recent budget, reducing the threshold from 100% relief, thus ripping a lifeline away from so many small businesses in Scotland. Then there is, of course, business rates. The, regi the regime in Scotland, which, as identified in the committee's report, places a huge disadvantage on Scottish businesses and remains a disincentive to invest. The report we have in front of us notes that evidence produced by the government showed that the current non-domestic rates regime is unequitable and unfair. <laughs> For anyone who has spoken with business owners in our town and city centres, this will be of no surprise. That is why it's so disappointing that the SNP refused to accept the Scottish Conservatives' proposal of a 75% business rate relief. As a result of the Barnet consequentials, this government could have provided the equivalent support to Scottish retail, hospitality and leisure businesses, which is enjoyed elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Sadly, this government chose to continue hammering businesses in our town centres with jacked up rates. There have been one change recently to non-domestic rates, and that's been the devolution of empty property uh, relief to local authorities, meaning the burden of providing the relief falls to our hard-pressed local councils. Now, my fear is that the relief may be withdrawn altogether, as they simply cannot afford to keep it going. At present in Aberdeen, we are seeing perfectly good office accommodation being pulled down to avoid the rate li liability, which seems crazy, but at least it's an option for them. But if you are an owner of a listed building, you do not have that option. But an empty listed building could be liable for non-domestic rates, depending on the position the council takes, which could be different from Ellen to Edinburgh. Now, this could have two outcomes. The first is that the owners are more flexible with their terms, so the building would be occupied. That is what we all want. But when I speak to the commercial property experts, they don't feel it's the rent that's the issue. It's the lack of demand that's the problem. So the second option is that owners simply walk away, adding to the decline in our town centres and listed buildings becoming a, a high risk for people to invest in. I guess time will tell, because I, I do not suppose any modelling has been done by this government on the potential impact. I'm turning to other people's contributions. We've heard from others today, and it was good to hear from Ros McCall's real-life experience working in retail, reminding us that many retailers will be working on their plans for Christmas trade just now, and there's only 299 shopping days until Christmas. And she mentioned House of Fraser. Aberdeen used to have a House of Fraser, just like it used to have a Debenhams, and like it used to have a BHS, and like it used to have a John Lewis. All of these have gone from Aberdeen's High Street, and they won't be replaced. And we need new thinking and new ideas. Claire ba Baker mentioned the demise of some of these big names in her opening. In Aberdeen, the old BHS building hopefully has a new use after Aberdeen was successful in 20 million of levelling up funds. 
Claire Baker also mentioned digital skills in Scotland has been falling behind the rest of the UK. And that's a worrying trend that has to be addressed urgently. And it's something they were hearing in the Finance Committee also. Jamie Halker Johnson also mentioned that the lack of e-commerce business support, something that Daniel Johnson also uh, mentioned. And it's, he had some great points about the skills required for people to start trading electronically. There was some good news. We heard that Dumfries is fighting back. Ross McCall also mentioned Cooper and the success there. And that's hopefully something that could be replicated across the country. Fiona Hislop spoke about the business improvement districts. And from my experience, they play a vital role. And they often leverage in additional funding from the levy that they raise. And she also spoke about the importance on the role of the cultural sector can play to improve our town centres. Graham Simpson spoke about East Kilbride and the, uh, the answer might be to move to housing and, and leisure. I would say it's a mix of things. I would like to add culture and hospitality to that. He also spoke about the 9.2 million of levelling up funding that, uh, and the, the need for all levels of government uh, to work together. And finally, Evelyn Tweed, I can share her memories of, of Woolies being dragged around the shops by my mum to CNA first and then pick and mix from Woolies as my reward. Elsewhere, other property failures of this government, policy failures of this government, are having severe impacts on our town centres. Despite promising in their 2016 manifesto to deliver 100% superfast broadband coverage for Scotland by the end of the next parliament, the SNP have presided over serious delays to the R100 scheme. So serious that we won't see this delivered in 2028. And this has a real impact on some of our uh, rural uh, shops and, and retail. Presiding officer, the devolved government has failed to put forward a plan that brings prosperity to our town centres and seem to want to manage the decline. So let me give some areas that they can look at. We could take steps to make our town centres more competitive by, by supporting Scotland's local councils to exempt high street and town centres from paying any business rates, realising business, releasing businesses of all shapes and sizes from restrictive and unfair taxation. We could take action to bring people back into our high streets by pr providing local authorities full funding to scrap parking charges in publicly owned car parks, encouraging people to support the high street. As Alec Rowley said, it's often easier to go out of town. We could stop this war on motors by making it easier for people to get into their towns and city centres. The Scottish Conservatives would take on the horde of to-let signs that are holding our high streets hostage by supporting communities' first right to buy. We'd reform planning laws to allow for the redevelopment of brownfield sites to help energise our towns and cities, encouraging new green spaces, revitalising our town centres, returning ex excitement and opportunity to them. As Ros McCall said, time is running out. But above all, President Officer, it, it is, we could pass is, on the so Barnett consequences and deliver the 75% rates relief so the Scottish businesses can operate on a level playing field as those in the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. Uh, and I now call on Tom Arthur to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to nine minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by reiterating my thanks to the committee and Clark's parliamentary officials and all who have contributed to producing this report. Um, I'm conscious that the uh, timing of the report at its inception did align with the publication of the detailed strategy of Scottish Government's response to the Town Centre Action Plan and parliamentary scrutiny of draft NPF4. But I think that speaks to the, the topicality of the matter and indeed the uh, sustained and profound interest in the future of our town centres, which has been demonstrated today. I'm going to try to, to respond to as many of the individual points that I've, I've raised, and I'm, I'm very grateful to colleagues for their mostly very measured, thoughtful and considered contributions, and in particular recognising it, this is a profound and strategic challenge that does not lend itself to any silver bullets or easy solutions. Indeed, I think more than one colleague has made reference to Professor Lee Sparks, and if I recall correctly, his remarks have were to the effect that we have spent 50 years doing things to harm our town centres and it's going to take 50 years to fix it. Now, I don't think any of us want to go and take 50 years to address the problems with our town centres. I think also it's important to recognise the points 
that Daniel Johnson made when he narrated the reality of the retail sector as something that has always been in flux and dynamic in responding to societal change, and indeed to the points that Fiona Hislop made, which is with regards to the need for town centres that are representative and fit for the 21st century. But it is important to recognise that addressing these problems will not be overnight. It requires sustained effort. It requires sustained effort across administrations, across parliamentary sessions, and across all layers of government, national, local. The UK government have a role to play as well within this in providing overall macro macroeconomic stability. And of course, our communities, and doing this in partnership as well with the private and the third sector, because to some extent our town centres are like the complexion of our economic system. Many of the challenges that we highlight with regard to town centres are reflections of deeper issues that actually lie within how our economy operates. And it reflects decisions, fundamental economic policy decisions that have been taken over many years. If we consider land, opening up land for out-of-town retail, and more residential development that is car dependent at the edge of our settlements, which has removed people from our town centres, reducing populations, reducing that population density that is so essential to provide the consumers for our town centre businesses. And indeed, in finance, internationalisation of finance and globalisation has brought tremendous opportunities and significant investment to Scotland, but it has also led us to a situation where many of our, re re um, many of our high street and town centre properties are owned by interests with no particular um, local connection to an area, and we all have recognised, as the committee has, the challenges that that brings. And this is why, in terms of our fundamental response amongst many of the other um, streams of work that have been outlined, community wealth building is going to be so important because community wealth building is about rewiring how our local and economic economies operate and it will be a byproduct of that. It will be a consequence of that rewiring of how our local economies operate in line with all of these other broader strategies that we start to see that material difference in the aesthetic and the range of shops and services that are available within our town centres. Now, there's a number of issues, quite specifically, that have been raised. Let me touch to one that is always the perennial matter on questions of our town centres and our high streets, and that is non-domestic rates. The legislation that underpins non-domestic rates has been in place, if I recall correctly, from 1854. We have had a recent piece of work that we have undertaken in reforming the implement and implementing the reforms of the Barclay Report. I also recognise that in these trying times there is an ask from business from for stability, and we have sought in the recently passed budget to meet the number one ask of businesses, which was a freeze in the poundage. But as I have discussed in the Chamber before and in previous exchanges I have had with Mr Johnson, I do recognise that one of the central challenges with non-domestic rates is the reality that rateable value does not often or does not always rather align with the economic performance of an individual business. So the question is then I put to colleagues in all sincerity, and it's a conversation I am happy to have, is if there's a desire to move on to a different system, what should that look like? Is this something that should be revenue neutral, bearing in mind that non-domestic rates are forecast to raise some £3 billion for public expenditure this year? What, what do we mean by rebalancing? These are some quite significant questions, but it's a, a conversation that I am happy to have and to engage in. I'll take Mr Johnson and I'll take Mr Simpson. Daniel Johnson. I, I'm very grateful. And he, he's right to pose uh, that, that challenge. But I, I think it's more than just individual businesses in the reflection of that. It's the fact that retail, while it's some 10 per cent of the economy, uh, provides some 20 per cent of non-domestic rates. And, and I think one of the things that the government will need to accept, and I think we all need to do, uh, accept, is that actually the static nature of, of non-domestic rates is probably a sign that it's not actually a, a functional a levy. Would, would you uh, uh, agree with that insight? Minister. I think Mr Johnson raises an important point, but I think the specific issue arises from the fundamental way in which non-domestic rates op operate as being a property tax. I'll come to Mr Simpson. Graham Simpson. I'm very grateful. Look, ir irrespective of what system we use, does the Minister not accept that there have been real concerns from the real retail sector about, about the Scottish Government not following uh, England and Wales in introducing an enhanced rates relief for smaller shops? 
I mean, he could have done that. Did he not accept that? Minister. I'm grateful to the member for his intervention. I think, as he would recognise, budgets are ultimately about choices and weighing up a range of priorities. It was always opportunity cost. We have fully committed all of the consequences we received as part of the budget as part of our budget process. And it's the question that we government poses to opposition members at each and every budget, which is if there is a desire to see increased funding in one budget line, when it's incumbent upon members to identify what the corresponding decrease is in another budget line, because the reality is that we do provide an enhanced social contract in Scotland, which is not available in other parts of the UK. And that is something from which employees and, users and people who live in our towns and town centres benefit from. But I would reiterate my invitation and my willingness to engage with members on the question of non-domestic rates. The, yes, I'll give way to Mr. Alec Riley. That the minister is always keen to engage. Does he accept? I think what the report is trying to say is that financially things seem to be skewed against town centres and against businesses in town centres, and skewed towards, you know, out of town, which which has had a massive devastating impact on town centres. Minister. The member raises a point which was raised in the, in, in the review of the Town Centre Action Plan, and that is the issue. Now, the question would be, in terms of what members are proposing, is it to try and modify how non-domestic rates lands through further relief or modifications, or is it to recognise that that is ultimately a feature of how the system operates as a tax on you know, heritable land and property? And as such, as in and of itself, it is something that requires fundamental reform. But this is, this is a very deep question. It's not something we're going to land an answer on immediately. But I think it, we're dealing with a system of taxation which is now 170 years old. And I think it's right and proper that notwithstanding the need to address the immediate concerns that business and the people we represent face in the cost of living crisis, it, we do ask ourselves, is non-domestic rates as a system you know, appropriate as we start to approach, it, approach the middle decades of this century? Is it something that is aligned with our ambitions around, yes, town centres, but also a just transition in net zero? And I think that's a conversation we should be more open to having in Parliament collectively as this session progresses, and hopefully, consensually, be able to land at a position ahead of the next election. So, as I say, my door is always open to have that conversation. I'm conscious that time is, is running out. I just want to highlight there was a number of points made about what more what, what can government do. Government Government does have an important role, and that's why we provide significant capital investment through our place-based investment programme, our vacant and derelict land investment programme, and as has been touched, upon, touched on by members, that can play such an important role, both in remediating land and financing projects directly, but also in creating stability, confidence and unlocking private sector investment as well. Fundamentally, President Officer, all of this work has to go here, and I have sought in my tenure to ensure that our retail strategy, our town centre action plan jointly published with COSLA, our national planning framework for, do align with each other. But fundamentally, and I think most profoundly, the way in which we can influence change for our town centres in the long term, not just beyond the immediate interventions we make in the here and now, is to rewire how our economies operate at the local and regional level. And community wealth building can be key to delivering that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> and I now call on Colin Beatty to wind up on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Up to 10 minutes, please, Mr Beatty. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As Vice Convener of the Economy and Fair Work Committee, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to close on this committee debate on the important subject, of course, of the Retail and Town Centres in Scotland report. But firstly, let me thank the committee clerks and the many other Parliament staff who worked so hard to help produce this report, and also those who gave their time to appear before the committee to give evidence or who submitted written evidence, not forgetting, of course, the committee members whose diligence and commitment ensured that a document of what I believe is real value was the end result. There was a substantial level of agreement in reaching conclusions, but also in identifying key issues, and to an extent, solutions, and I say to an extent in regard to solutions, because the regeneration of our town centres is a complex exercise which will involve many stakeholders in order to achieve success. The debate this afternoon has been, uh, I think, on the whole, a very positive one, and I think uh, it's uh, interesting that the, so many of the members actually came forward with the, the same highlights, the same concerns, and the same 
desires to achieve results in particular areas. And I would touch on, firstly, the question of uh, non-domestic rates, where Alec Rowley, Colin Smith, Michelle Thompson and the convener Claire, Claire uh, Baker uh, mentioned the concerns about non-domestic rates. There, there have been a considerable discussion by the committee and uh, the imbalance, the cost imbalance between out-of-town development and town centre regeneration has been an issue. Should NDR be reduced in town centres and increased in out-of-town developments to encourage town centre regeneration? The committee did agree that the overarching principle must be rebalancing the cost of doing business in town centres versus out-of-town sites. And a variety of options were considered and highlighted in the report, but generally NDR is perceived as inequitable and unfair. E-commerce, or more correctly the lack of it, featured also substantially in the committee's discussions, and Jamie Hawker-Johnson and again Claire Baker uh, highlighted this. And I think it came as a surprise to me and I think to the committee that uh, Scottish businesses only had a, a 4% share by volume of UK e-commerce. And the need to upskill and strengthen Scottish capabilities was, was well explored. The needs for training and support for particularly small businesses was identified. And the committee noted that the £100 million allocated by the Scottish Government to improve digital skills, capacity and capability uh, was significant. But the committee was interested to find out how the, how the government intended to allocate these funds and had views on it being directed to provide support to businesses in order they can develop omni-channel models. Accessibility to town centres featured quite highly as well. Uh, I mean, in today's uh, discussions, Fiona Hislop, Alex Rowley, uh, and Graham Simpson all mentioned various aspects of accessibility, be it by transport uh, or availability of car parking, uh, ability to walk around the streets and be able to uh, access the shops and so on, which are, which are so important for regenerating our town centres. The question of NPF4 was seen as a key driver in town centre development. And while members had different views on whether a moratorium on out-of-town development in NPF4 is part of the solution, all members did agree that NPF4 must ensure that for any developments, town centre sites must be fully evaluated to ensure that there is no adverse impact on town centres. And the Scottish Government, in their response, affirmed their commitment to that principle, but concerns remain as to how this principle can be further strengthened by the Scottish Government. The question of absentee landowner, uh, landowners, uh, owners of properties, particularly properties that were decaying, properties that were in need of repair or derelict, that was fully discussed by the committee as well. And uh, uh, the Minister, Fiona Hislop, Claire Baker, Colin Smith, uh, Gordon MacDonald and others have mentioned this as a particular concern. And this, this, uh, the committee did take evidence that absentee and landowners remain the problem in some towns and a hindrance to development of out-of-town centres. Uh, in some cases, identifying the beneficial owner can be difficult, and this is especially so if they live overseas. Uh, the committee looked at compulsory purchase orders as a means to deal with such buildings, especially when they were derelict or dangerous. The committee asked the Scottish Government to undertake wider research elsewhere to determine what the position is on beneficial ownership of commercial property and land. More clearly needs to be done in this barrier, but it was noted by the Scottish Government that the UK Government has launched a register which will require overseas entities buying or selling land and property across the UK to be registered. But it's unclear at this time, I think, how that will be made available to local authorities, for example, in Scotland. The committee had some sympathy for an online sales tax, um, which might level the field between town centre businesses and competitors who have no bricks and mortar. But that was not seen as an easy option, and it would need to be con carefully constructed to achieve its target. The UK Government are not proceeding with their proposed online sales tax, and the Scottish Government have undertaken to review the complexities involved. 
but it should be noted that given the business, that business taxation is largely a reserved matter, any proposals would need to be negotiated with the UK Government. The principle that every town should have its development plan was widely accepted, and while the Scottish Government explained that through various mechanisms this already existed, it is somewhat unclear how these various strands come together with the focus which the Committee viewed the Town Centre Development Plan needs. Now, these Town Centre Development Plans were seen as key. Each town is a unique uh, entity. There is no one-size-fits-all. Therefore, it is tremendously important that each entity does have its own development plan. The Committee noted that uh, the three enterprise agencies, Scottish Enterprise, South of Scotland Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, appear to have differing remits and focus for delivery. And there seems to be a gap in delivery of place-based support out with HIE and SOSE. The Scottish Government advised that this support is in fact in place, but feedback indicates that this is not widely recognised. The one key element identified by the committee was the need for sustainability, and this has actually been touched on by uh, Maggie Chapman and, and the Minister himself. Uh, funds can be available to develop a particular project or regeneration, but it is necessary that the project be long-term sustainable within the community in which it has been developed. And it would be unsatisfactory if long-term funding had to be provided to sustain the project if the community is unable to do so. This, this makes it even more important that local communities are part of such plans at an early stage to ensure they meet local needs and that a viable business plan is in place. The Small Business Bonus Plan has removed more than 100,000 small businesses from playing NDR. Broadly, it has been a success. The Scottish Government notes that some reforms took place in the last budget to improve its progressive aspects, but more data is needed to better evaluate its impact. The concerns about the burden on businesses resulted in data collection not being carried out to the extent required. Now, one or two other members made uh, significant contributions. Colin Smith made a, a very strong plug for Dumfries as a place to live in and, and enjoy. Uh, Alec Growley appeared to be arguing that Cooper Fife was, the, in fact, the centre of the universe. But, uh, <laughs> yes, of course. Fiona Hislop. I have split loyalties. I'm, I'm definitely a fan of all my uh, West Lothian towns, but on the basis that three of the SNP speakers were brought up in air, I do think that air, as well as Cooper, deserves special mention in this debate. <laughs> Colin Beattie. I, I couldn't possibly comment. Um, in, con in conclusion, the retail sector is a vital element in driving the regeneration of our town centres, while the need to consult extensively with local communities remains absolutely key. There is no one size fits all. Each town and its communities are different. Each need is different, and I believe that this has been recognised and accepted across the board. I mean, the committee looks forward to the finalised retail strategy delivery plan from the Retail Industry Leadership Group and to seeing the part which MPF, MPF 4 will play in creating an environment where our town centres will prosper. And I commend this report to Parliament. Thank you.